Okay, I'll go ahead and call the uh, the May 24th, um, 2023 Nottingham Planning Board meeting to order. Um, before I begin, I'll go around the room and have uh, members introduce themselves, starting on my on my right. Robert Davies, alternate. Teresa Bascom. Ian McKinnon. Edward Beal. Charlene Anderson. Blair Haney, SRPC. And Mr. Davies will be seated and voting tonight for Ms. Sandler. Um, so we have a few things on the agenda tonight. We're just going to take everything in order, unless there's any uh, comment from the board. Otherwise, the first is continuation for case number 23-004 SUV, residences at Fort Hill, Smoke Street at Fort Hill Road. Application from Barry Surveying and Engineering on behalf of Owl Ridge Builders, requesting a 25 lot open, sub, uh, open space subdivision. The property is located at Smoke Street and Fort Hill Road in Nottingham, Minnesota, identified as tax map 23, lot 11. Two conditional use permits have been applied for. Article 3, Section B, item number 6, permits a request to allow disturbance within 25 feet of the wetland. Article 4, Section S, 8.2, permits a request for lots that have larger than maximum area, allow frontages less than prescribed, and allow a reduction to the landscape buffer. And again, this is a continuation of a public hearing that began on um, May 10th, I believe. Is correct? Yes, sir. Yeah. So uh, to catch everybody up, uh, as I was not here at that meeting, but they had a chance to watch the the, uh, the meeting on YouTube. Um, the case was accepted as complete, or the application was accepted as complete, I apologize. And there was a motion, I believe, to that this is not a development of regional impact. Mm -hmm. And since this time, a site walk was conducted uh, a week ago tonight, um, led by Mr. McKinnon. And uh, it was open to the public. And we can discuss that as we go forward. And I had a chance, I was not in that, but I had a chance to walk the site the day before. Um, Personally, so um, before we jump in, I know Mr. Haney has submitted some revised comments based on on information that was received. And um, did you want to touch base on any of that, Blair? Um, yeah, uh, with regards to the conditional use permit, I had I had um, just wanted to confirm that I was reading it right. Maybe others had the same problem with which. Uh, the exact sections of the zoning ordinance that the conditional permit for is for in the open space development part of it, not the wetland conservation part of it, but um, or excuse me, actually both parts. Just to confirm it, make sure we got the right articles. We're all looking and looking at and talking about the same thing. Um, I did notice there was a document existing watershed uh, proposed watershed. If you just want to maybe give the top line, you know what that is. And then um, with regards to the yield plan, um, the Aquifer District does uh, require a CUB for blasting. I just want to make sure that if the roads are going in, uh, I know we're talking about the yield plan, but we are talking about the Aquifer District and where roads can go. So uh, just can, making sure we're on the same page with that. And then uh, the yield plan had uh, shown roadways that uh, right of way road right of ways that appear to be closer to 50 feet from adjacent property lines um, and wanted to make confirm that those standards were met uh, and I listed a few a few different places and uh, mr. Barry I know you submitted some additional materials to that we've requested to kind of help with identify the yield plan and, and the, the lot sizes, removing some information to make it a little bit clearer. Yep. On the, did you want to touch base on anything, or uh, I'll let you speak as to anything we submitted, or uh, in response to any of the items that we they'd gone over during the, um, the last public hearing? And I know I'd submitted some comments, uh, questions, just to make sure everything was touched upon. Sure. Uh, so. Um, just sort of to let you know where we think we're at and and um, where we hope to make a little progress tonight. Um, I uh, have received Mr. Beal's comments. I've received Ian's comments. Uh, a few of the other board members made some comments last meeting. Uh, I was in hopes of getting comments from CMA engineers, which we have not gotten yet. Um, I'd like to go through cohesively and take care of all of those comments at one time, if possible. Um, so I haven't uh, done that, and therefore I didn't write a 10-page response letter to, to all those comments. Um, 
I think Ian uh, brought up a good point at the last planning board meeting. I think the rational nexus uh, between us and, uh, and moving forward is really to ensure that uh, the yield plan is sound, solid, and that everybody agrees um, with the yield plan. Uh, so the basis of my resubmittal was to ensure that uh, it was a little more legible. Um, I realized that we had lot areas and all the data was sort of placed in the middle of the lot and it was hard to uh, decipher. Uh, and so uh, all I did was none of the yield plan has changed. I just plucked all that information out and leaded it in uh, so that the members could see the, uh, see the information, see where the steep slopes are, uh, see what was 50, 50 feet in width and those types of things, see the setbacks um, so that you can um, determine, uh, hopefully that what we've determined and that this is, would be a reasonable uh, yield plan. Um, additionally, um, I would just point out that uh, the original submission had uh, notes on there that described that each one of the lots uh, had widths greater than 50 feet in the calculations. They had uh, all of the subtractable items uh, subtracted from the lot areas uh, so that you knew that uh, we had considered that and the lots that are technically in quote unquote the flood zone, which is 150 feet above the river. Um, those areas were not counted uh, in those lot areas. So uh, we considered uh, those lots to be uh, buildable. Uh, secondly, uh, we've since met with the Conservation Commission about our uh, condition of use permit. Uh, we would like uh, the board to discuss that with us tonight. We hope the board might be in a position to take action on that. If not, and you need additional information, I'd be happy to try and uh, gather that for you. Uh, the Conservation Commission um, had a favorable uh, response to the project, <coughs> felt that we designed the project uh, the best and most reasonable way possible. Uh, they had a couple of uh, minor conditions that I note that uh, they've placed in their uh, letter to you, uh, which we helped suggest as part of that process, uh, and we're happy to implement as part of the, uh, the project plan. Uh, as the chairs pointed out, we did uh, conduct a site walk, Kevin from my office, uh, walked uh, the members around the project site, pretty much the center of the roadway from what I understand. I think one, uh, two things that came out of that are there's a culvert that's blocked uh, in the existing trail. Uh, we would work with the applicant and DES to maybe do a restoration of that area, uh, potentially just remove the culvert altogether because it's really not needed anymore. Um, and that would um, allow that to free flow and be more naturally flowing. And then the second thing that came out of the site walk is the potential to move the driveway that's on Fort Hill uh, a little further from the abutting boundary line uh, to uh, ensure there's a little more separation there. So uh, those are the things that I came prepared tonight to talk about. If the board wants to talk about uh, the waiver requests and at least get some detail on that, I'd be happy to go through that also. And then the, um, the three conditional use permits that are associated with the open space subdivision if we want to discuss those and, and glean anything we can from that, uh, I would appreciate that. So I guess with that, I'd be happy to try and field any questions that you have. Sure. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for seeing that. Um, and to make sure, when I, I walked the site by myself and, uh, and I ran some individuals from your office that were starting to flag the center line as I was finishing up, the Fort Hill location, mm -hmm. I believe it was in the right spot. So it's where the corner was, there's an old trailer kind of there. Yep. That's where I went in and I mean, there was flagging, so I, yep. That's the correct one. Okay. Mm -hmm. Want to make sure that's where everybody else went into. So, um, we do have a letter from the CONCOM that, that uh, Mr. Barry just touched upon. <coughs> I can read it, or it is in our, our packets as to what their recommendations were and their su support so, um, of the condition use permit with some conditions that were, were uh, agreed to. Um, I'll go ahead and just read that in. Uh, if that's or we will summarize it. So they met with the applicant on May 8th. They uh, talked about the downspouts and, or drip edges to direct um, flow off roofs to, to dry wells, perimeter drains, foundation drains. We also reduce runoff and impervious services by redirecting the rainwater into the ground system. The wetland impact for disturbance within 25 feet of a wetland was studied. It was determined that the open space development design and the resulting proximity to the wetland was a fair trade-off and that the disturbance would be minimal. Uh, the potential archaeological significance of the esker located in the central portion was of concern. The study was conducted by the Nadnock Archaeological Services uh, at the applicant's expense. Um, that indicated 
that no paleo human activity at the site. There was some discussion about the large area of disturbance as Esker. Other concerns put forward by the commission members were as follows to limit the use of road salt in the aquifer area, that four to six inches of loam be replaced on the entire lot site to encourage revegetation. Timber cutting be suspended from April 1st to October 1st with respect to wildlife breeding, the rearing of young, and subsequent migration. And that signage, medallions be erected to identify the open space area and to identify the wetlands in the wetland 25 foot no disturbed buffers. And that the percentage of uplands versus wetland will be determined and add to the site plans. The, the portion should conform to non zone ordinance regulations, uh, section S.9. Uh, all these points were acceptable to Mr. Barry. He will post signage along the internal roads to identify a minimum of salt use area. We will post wetland buffers and easement medallions, the latter of which have been used to denote protected areas of public lands and OSD subdivisions. Only mineral tree and vegetation removal will occur during the sensitive wildlife period. In summary, the commission approves the application for a CUP or condition use permit to allow disturbance within 25 feet of a wetland per Article 3, Section B6. statements there is there uh and we do have a i, I guess I can, i'll wait till we get to public hearing to read any letters that we receive from the public um, i'll bring it back to the to the board for discussion is there anything else the board um had for questions i, I just had a couple questions maybe the chris that you could um answer um from the commissioner report or maybe sam um i thought i saw sam hand yes um it says here, each house will have a downspout and or drip edge that will be directed into a drive well. Is that some, somewhere noted in the plans here? Yes. Okay. Yep. So that was brought up at the meeting because I, I mentioned it. It's part of our project design yeah. and, and plan set. Okay. Yes. And then the... Um, but just to be clear, it's on the recording sheet. Okay. Um, so that nobody can claim they didn't know. Okay. Uh, it's part of the conditions of the recording sheet. And then um, the Mananoc Archaeological Services um, study, will we begin a copy of that? or You will now. Uh, at the time of the uh, commission meeting, Mananoc had prepared the report and we had submitted it to DHR. DHR had not accepted it and approved it, and so it's not available for the public until that takes place. It's now been accepted and approved, and so I'll submit a copy of that to the town. Great, thanks. Any other board comment? Uh, relative to the commission or just in general? No, just in general. in general. Yeah, I'll jump around, nothing major. I think, I assume, I think you mentioned you'll, you'll address uh, public works comments, but one of the things we noticed on the site walk is that, and I think there were some, some of the people that were at the site walk, we were kind of confused that uh, the public works director made a comment question and this is from uh, what was submitted prior, you know for, for the first meeting uh, we had some bullet points um, I question the added runoff water that will impact the pond next to Fort Hill Road did the hydraulic study pick that up and the culvert that crosses Fort Hill Road from that pond um, I'm just trying to get clarification is he referring to Nottingham Lake is that or is he referring to the the wetland down the probably the swamp at the, yeah. at the beginning okay yeah, because one thing I notice is he's referring to the culvert that crosses Fort Hill. And there is no I culvert. I didn't see a culvert yeah, right. anywhere around that it's bend, it's so yep. I don't know. This yeah, there's a culvert right there, but there's a fever dam or a fever watch. But is that farther down? No, it's right as you turn in, so you take a left, or how are you coming? Fort Hill Road. It kind of bends to the right, and right at that bend to the right, if you look to the left, there's a swamp right there, and the culvert is right there. But that's not near this connection that's point, right? right? That's more near the Frederick Lane side. Okay, that's what I thought. I'm like, I, I, I drove around, I looked, I was like, I don't even see many culverts on this road. Yeah. Okay. I believe he's speaking about the, so it, it would be just to the... He's referring to flow from the Frederick backside. of the area. If you went, continue going down Fred, what's proposed Frederick Lane, that, I think it's like a heron rookery, that, that pond, that area, I believe it's somewhere over there. What might be speaking towards. So he's saying, because hydraulically, if I mean, I guess via the yield plant, potentially there'd be some development back there, but via the open space, I don't think hydraulically that's. I, I think to answer the question in general, we're not increasing rate. Yeah. That's what I'm trying to 
off off site in any any particular direction that would change the hydrology of of flow anywhere off site. Fair enough. So I think maybe we just start. We try and stay focused, and uh, do we just want to focus on the yield plan itself and take things one by one and take votes as needed, unless people want to jump around? But yeah. So um, and I can kind of run through some of my comments from what I got on the site. Well, so there was a couple of cleanup items, and maybe uh, I'm not about these. I think there was a few lots where you know we always require two test pits per 4K area, and I saw a few where I think there was one shown. Yep. Uh, so you might have already caught that and addressed it. Um, the uh, the Fort Hill shared driveway is being proposed. Um, if that's that's probably immediately after where the pavement ends, you know there might be a, a question there, possibility of extending the pavement to that point so that you know it, it just reduces the extra extra burden on the end of that pavement there. Um, Especially where it's a, it's a good corner. Uh, mm -hmm. Let's see. Uh, there was a few just like notable trees. Like I don't know if Concom picked these up, but on Frederick Lane, I don't think they're anywhere necessarily near where you're proposing to cut in. But anywhere that you can save a, a like a mass tree or whatever, mm -hmm. there was a nice oak right as you went into where Frederick Lane was being proposed, and then somewhere along that trail where there was a, a fork. With a really large black birch that was in really good health, so things like that you can save some of those um, wherever possible. You know that's always encouraged. Um, let's see, uh, I'm sure this is already mentioned. Drainage, like any drainage easements or anything like that, usually the request now is to keep that with the HOA. Yes. Um, yeah. and any conservation covenants and easement HOA language, those always get reviewed by our town council, which I know you're familiar with. Yes. yes. And we so we've started that process with the, our project attorney, um, and we'll submit those uh, earlier than we did on the Mitchell Road one so we don't get hung up at the end over that. And then my, my biggest concern, and I guess we'll, we can deal with this after with the, the yield plan, it was just, um, there was a few areas as I walked, and I'm not a wetland scientist, so I don't know, but mm -hmm. they're not flagged as well, and if there, if there was a flag, a test pit, um, there's some areas where there was some standing water or standing of the leaves of gray and things like that. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if that was natural and would be considered wetland or, or not, or if that was identified by the, uh, the wetland scientists. Um, I think even when I when I walked it, what do you know what, like what station or what area you might yeah, have been in? Yeah, I'll find it. I've got a few of them marks. Um, as I walked it, the uh, Peekaboo Drive, the area at the beginning was uh, between Test Pit 33 and 34 was wet at that time, and maybe that's what you were talking about. Mm -hmm. the, is that the area because yep. of the culvert? Okay. Yep. So. We, we did walk that there's a trail, just so you know, we kind of came in, yep. and then the trail, you might have noticed the ATV trail kind of like, yeah, it came goes this way, you yeah. know, kind of goes back. Yeah, we walked over, and you could you could see that the culvert was blocked, and there was probably a two foot differential between one side and the other, and yeah, there's like okay. a trickle coming out. So it was, it was pretty clear that the even the trail itself was flooded. Um, we walked it prior to the board walking it, and it alarmed me at first, also <laughs> until okay. I determined what was causing the issue. Yeah, yeah, and then on uh, proposed. Um, sorry. Is it Keep looking back. I keep want to say Fernal Lane, but Frederick Lane. Uh, t test bit 14. I, I think like that was wet when I walked it. Um, as was number the area of number eight, which is a 4K area. So Ed, when you say wet, is was there standing water or? Yeah. I mean, was it right in the test hole? No, no, no. So it was uh, like near it. It was just near near that area. Okay. So there yeah. was no flagging, nothing that on the plan showing it was well. So again, may not meet the criteria for wetland, might have been just standing water uh, from from heavy rains or from prior logging operations where. Right. Uh, yeah, um, I mean, just so that the so that you and the board are aware, uh, Jack uh, Hayes, John Hayes prepared both the wetlands poorly drained boundary and also the very poorly drained boundary. 
but he also prepared the soils map and he conducted all of the test pits on site uh, with us. Um, so I'm quite confident in his his delineation. Yeah, if they didn't come up on the site walk for anybody else, then, then that's fine with that. Uh, so I mentioned the two test pits. Um, the, the, my biggest thing was is obviously and I think that's probably mentioned by others is uh, is for Peak of the Drive that the the steepest of that area to, that's being proposed to, to cut through. Mm -hmm. And then if you look at the, the proposed cuts in that area, some of them are you know, 30, 40, 50 feet yes. of cut. Yep. And I don't know how wide that's going to be an uh, area that's going to have to get disturbed um, to be able to get the side slopes to a point where it's you not know, an erosion problem. So, um, so that's shown on the overview grading plan, the wideness of it, how wide it is. Um, it's really uh, working on it. Sheet 49 of 70. <clears throat> so sheet 49, that's that overall. So we show the profile because we need to show a profile. But really, they're going to go in and they're going to remove that material down to that grade that's shown on that grading plan. Yep. And then, they'll, then they will construct the road after that. So... Um, I was careful to design the material removal to be between 8 and 10%. Um, so those are even flatter than your average roadside um, roadside cut would be. So an 8 to 10% slope is, is actually pretty flat. Um, and uh, we have sediment erosion control uh, plans specific to the phase of the removal of the material so that those areas are done and stabilized with um, those controls in place prior to uh, further construction so that uh, none of that um, area is eroded down into the the, uh, the swales that would be constructed as part of the road and then was, uh, same thing so obviously I'm guessing some of that cut that's going through is that could be added as fill for some of the lots to be yes filled with, so obviously the ones that are walking up Right, the right. That's right, because those obviously dropped off. Yeah, so that's going to bring them up to grade or yes. Yep. Yeah, the uh, some of the test bits were you know pretty pretty far far down there. Um, number fifty four, uh, to 50, 53, 54, That area where it just kind of trails off. So. Some, some of the test pit location is also where we could get a machine that day also, so. Yeah. Um. Okay. And then the area, and, then, and I apologize if this was addressed and I was not here for it, the area that is shown on, that's like along Smoke Street between Peekaboo and, and Frederick, mm -hmm. that, is that just not part of the lot currently? That there's a part of that curve that right away um. uh, so I'm not sure what you're referring to I guess yeah I'm gonna go back and see. maybe maybe it's gonna show I'm sorry so uh, next to peekaboo mm -hmm. where the line goes there's uh, is that an easement area to the uh, so if you're looking, it would be to the east of oh, I'm sorry, south, south uh, Peekaboo Drive. Yeah. You're talking about you're talking about the easement area for that is easement area, the old Summer Street. Is that what we're talking about? Where no, are you on? Where are you on? About this section. Oh, that could just be the plan, maybe. Are you talking about the color, the difference in color? Yeah, so maybe it's just the plus. Oh, line. it might just be. So if I can show you, on yeah, the, like the yield plan here, mm -hmm. this section right here, here's Peekaboo going oh, in. That's just this poor. The yield. That's just poor drafting. Okay. I didn't know, <laughs> yeah. I didn't know if that was an easement area that wasn't identified. Or nope. That, nope. Yeah, because of the curve there. Okay. Nope. All right. Thank you. <laughs> Is there anything else from the uh, board? If I think I. Try to be as thorough as I can. I'll just wait until you get through mine, which yep. kind of overlapped a little bit with with yours. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, and I know I was just I just checked too. I know we, we did Alana did get an update from CMA. They've gotten through most of everything, and that they they did say that they hope to have a full review. We've gone through everything 
relatively soon. So, yeah, apologize. fingers crossed it'll be. They were hopeful to have it back ahead of this meeting, and then they, they indicate that because of the yeah. size of everything and the complexity, they, they, they needed some more time to complete that review. So, I apologize that it wasn't done for tonight. Mm -hmm. No, I think I'm. I went through these yield plans. That these ones look similar to what obviously I looked at. Before. Are these the same exact ones that were in the? Are these? They're, they're, they're the exact same. They're right? identical. Yeah. I've just taken the annotations out of the way. Perfect. Yeah. Um, at first glance, I, everything looks good. The only question I had, and I think you know, it kind of goes back to it. You make the note there is that I looked at lot 1114, which is on the sheet 35 there, which is up on the right side. I was wondering, making sure we kind of had that. Looks like it would just meet that 50 foot kind of between the steep slopes and the side setback. So, so that's the only lot that I really looked at. That was 1114. 1114. Yeah, yeah, that's the tightest lot in the yield plan, and yep. it, it definitely meets it because I struggled with it. <laughs> yep. Okay. Yeah, that was the only thing I really noticed. It was really two lots are funky. They work. They meet the regulation in terms of frontage, um, stuff like that. So, and I think you noted via the yield. Um, everything exceeds the frontage requirements, um, oftentimes by quite a bit. Right. And um, inherently because of lot size requirements, stuff like that. So I, nothing stood out to me from the yield <coughs> plan perspective as to a lot that I really was pushing back on um, or had much concern with. And that's, that's partially because we're, we've got a lot of lot area. And I believe when this came through as a design review, it was 26 at that time. So yeah, or 27. It was a it was a yeah, higher it was, number. It was a higher number. Pared yeah. down. Yep. And I do see that you know you calculated for the three acre minimums in the optimal protection district for any area that was impacted by that zone for the yield plan. Um, so that's accounted for. And again, it helps when some of that other information is stripped out that we'll be able to see it, and, and it's good to confirm when, when the uh, proposed buildable areas. You know, one side may but up against a, a different setback, so the, the line changes. Right. So it's always good to make sure that that was calculated mm -hmm. appropriately. Mm -hmm. that line. Full scale helps also. Yes. Along the lines, because we mentioned the aquifer protection, just playing a little bit, and I think Blair, you would comment on this, is that the aquifer protection zone has that 10% limit. I didn't know it. That should, I mean, I could. You'd have, to, I mean, these slots are so big, I guess I'd have a hard time finding 10%. I think it would be more so at the, this might be more getting ahead of us when we get to the open spaces, but we still have to apply that 10% because obviously the 10% now is a much smaller. But yeah, none of, but none of our, problem. yeah, none of our lots are in the aquifer zone. Oh, in the open space, that's right. right. We intentionally exist on the lot, but we're not in right. it. I intentionally designed this entire subdivision to avoid the aquifer zone, except for the two large lots on Fort Hill. Gotcha. Yeah. I don't know if anybody else had anything, but um, I think everything on the yield plan was prevent, presented clearly, which is kind of helps us make that determination if we're in support of the yield, which obviously allows everything else to move forward. Yeah, I just had a question. Could you walk me through the entrance into um, off of Fort Hill Road? I, you know, I, I have a, a wooden ruler and I'm trying to measure what the width is between the where the line is, where you know, what the width is on this section. It's 75. That that is 75 feet, and then on the other side. So there's 75 feet of road frontage, and that's a basic box. Okay. Is that what you're asking? Yeah, and what's, so here's, this is the road going in, right? Yep. So yep. what's the distance between the abutters lot and, and the road? I don't have an answer to that. Okay. Because that looked like to me it was like less than, yeah, 50 feet. Oh, you're saying because of the road setback requirement? Yeah, so I, that's what I was wondering is is that if, if
if that is because actually my ruler was showing that's probably around 100 feet but well if it's 75 if, there's if there's no way that that road would fit in a 75 foot width and meet 50 feet from each of butter you essentially need a hundred and at least 120 20 ish 124 feet right to make that work and that's what came up in some of that discussion with that is that it can be lot specific almost like some especially where there's an existing right of way and to be honest a lot of these there's a reason there's 50 or 75 feet left on this huge track of land because that's that that was the intent the point of access so. I guess my question was because of that is the road is the road actually is is it an actual allowable roadway going into that off of that road if it was designed as conventional yeah yeah I don't think that so I'd ask council similar question about yield plans um, for a different case prior to this as to does the yield plan have to meet you know, all existing right. or anything like that or can be submitted that may require some reasonable some relief is that what you use? variance reasonable relief and things like that or, or to lean towards the latter that that unless we specify hard and fast in our regulations which we don't um, that the yield plan can can be submitted that would potentially require, you know, variances or conditions permits. And some of those, obviously, you know, if there's wetland impacts, would require a variance. Yeah. Um, to fill things of that nature to be able to build it. So. I'm not sure I'm following on that because I'm, I'm looking at this going for this yield plan. It's showing, unless I'm reading it wrong, the road going in and going through that large hill, which I know the open space development is going to go to, but you would be doing that for a, a normal house development. I don't know that they would necessarily do that. Well, just to be clear, the yield plan goes around the base of that hill. But your development doesn't. That's right. But so steep, you, you don't have a steep slope ordinance where we're prohibited from touching and developing steep slopes. Your steep slopes uh, addresses whether or not you can put a building on them. Well, yeah, I know that. Yes, yeah, so it's just discounted. Yeah, we call it environmentally sensitive areas, but we don't um, don't restrict necessarily their disturbance. And. The yield plan shows 25, which is what you're going with with the open space. The yield plan shows nice, large, two, three plus acre lots. Your OSD is going to be less than an acre each. Per, right? uh, in, per yeah, per the zoning ordinance, they range between three and one, uh, thirty thousand, and one acre. Uh, we have two lot, well, a few, a few, uh, three or four lots in the subdivision that are larger than that. Uh, which is one of the reasons we're asking for a conditional use permit to allow us to go larger than one acre and the homes that are going in are they is it a house with a garage and a shed and everything so all 25 folks aren't going to be coming before the zoning board asking for variances to do things on their property that they don't have the space for yes so uh, we've provided for home layouts they're reasonable size homes um, the lots that are on Fort Hill will have larger homes that are placed on them. Uh, the lots on Frederick Drive will have larger homes placed on those just due to their footprint. The ones on Peekaboo, uh, we have specific layouts uh, that the, the, our clients have been building and uh, provide for an adequate size home, garage, and, and uh, usable space, yes. Garage and shed? Uh, yes. Yeah, you could very. You could. You could quite meet the setback requirements. Yeah, you uh, could quite easily. Well, I care you could, about that. I do care. Well, about I mean, that it, it is a good point because good we're point. we're involved in in a lot of projects in other communities, um, not as rural as Nottingham, but in more dense areas, and we we develop these things, and then oftentimes we're having to start thinking about how people live, and I think that's the way you're trying to yes. think. 
you know you have a you might have a small colonial drive under home uh, with because it's a drive under you don't really have a garage so you can't store anything and so you need relief for your storage well these lots are deep enough so that you have plenty of room for sheds these aren't uh, these aren't constrained lots environmentally uh, pretty much every stitch of the, the lot is buildable Is there any other comment from the board? Not on the uh, not on the yield plan, no. Right. So before we, um, I guess uh, the order that we take this tonight is so it's you know up to us. So I guess before I before we vote on the yield plan versus uh, to move forward with, I'll go ahead and open the public hearing at this point so we can get comment, mm -hmm. um, and then when it close out, we'll, we'll, we'll we can move forward on the uh, on the other part of it there. So go ahead and um, open the public hearing. Uh, again, it's been continued. So if anybody would like to speak for uh, this application, please come forward first. Otherwise, against or just could general questions come up after. Um, just identify yourself and um, name and address. And again, speak towards the board, please, not backwards towards the room. And while people are coming up, I'm just going to read. We did get a couple of letters. Um, one was dated yesterday. Uh, from a Mary Crock, uh, I believe, on Trimbley Drive. What's that? It's Crockett. Oh, well, they left off. Yeah, there was no T, yes. Yeah, they left the, um, the name. Uh, I'm going to read it in ver verbatim. So, I am saddened to see another subdivision will be allowed in Nottingham. Variances are set aside with little consideration. Why do we have them if they're set aside when requested? What is the impact on the wetlands that will be removed, replaced, and supposedly better? Uh, so they say that than what has been there for many, many years. <clears throat> A mountain removed to make way for houses and change the landscape forever. Uh, what will that do to the surrounding area in the next hundred year flood? The impact on Smoke Street from additional traffic, which is in dire need of repair, and also on our police, fire department, and our school. I guess we've totally sold out the progress in our town while failing to provide safe, functional infrastructure to support our growing community. How sad to not limit development. So, during public comment, I usually don't address you know point by point. I usually wait till the end. But I think there's some things in here that it's good to clarify for the public in general. Uh, one is that we are regulated by the state. We are children of the state. So we have to operate within the bounds and laws of the state of New Hampshire, which are the revised statutes annotated or RSAs. Um, so we are allowed, we're permitted to um, have zoning ordinances and subdivision regulations, but we still have to conform to state law. Uh, and in there, it's also landowner rights. So there are landowner rights. Development is a part of that. But we have a master plan, subdivision ordinance, site plan review uh, regulations, and zoning ordinances to govern what the town uh, what the town wants to see for development or how it's developed. And all of those items, especially the zoning ordinance, are voted upon by the, the public, and by the town residents, um, and approved or not approved. So, um, so we try to balance it in when applicants come forward we do have our guide our guides to go through and measure against um i don't believe there's any wetland direct wetland impacts being proposed by this uh by this plan at least in the open space subdivision uh, there are buffers that are um that, that may be impacted but we do have conditional use permits or uh, rules within our our own regulations to address those as well Anything beyond that that goes to zoning for a variance, that is not the purview of this board. Uh, and that has its own criteria to meet. Um, <coughs> and as to infrastructure, uh, we do address some of those things through the through impact fees. Uh, police does not have an impact fee, fire department does, which is gonna be being reviewed, and school has an impact fee as does recreation. So we, do, we do try to account for it by the additional burden or impact from any new development on those areas by by looking at those by imposing impact fees uh let's see there was a second letter which i just think it's important the uh, to the you know the part of that is there, there's a common sentiment that i think i see is that there should be limiting to development and that's where i think to your point the landowner writes that we we don't have the authority to place limits if it's if it's within the law so we do actually have per the rsa have the ability to put a hold on development if it's 
deemed that there's a stress on our, our um, community, that it, it has to be specified as to why and for a period of time. Yeah, you right. have to and do a study to correct, and that's the, to that, and then that goes to the voters to decide. Correct, it's a pretty involved process. It is to a, even it is do a big that. process. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. uh, you basically can only put a moratorium motor, moratorium in for one year. Yeah, it's usually one year extendable for up to five and, on one year increments. And the towns that have recently done that are being contested. They all get they all get contested. <laughs> good. So we do we do. We all live in the town. Obviously, to be on the board, we have to live in the town, so we do all um, take care about the town and the, and the character of it, um, which is why we serve on the board. So we are cognizant of uh, trying to balance landowner rights, meaning abutters as well, with with the town side of things. Did you read? I did read that one, okay. and we have we have Mr. Okay. Weston here all as right. well. So that was that was a new comment for tonight. Hi, uh, Lawn Weston, 24 Hill Road. Uh, yeah, my only com uh, concern is is with the driveway. Um, as I mentioned, for those of you that joined the uh, sidewalk, um, there's just one portion before it kind of bends off to the right where you have a clear view of the pool. So I was wondering if there's any way we could just push that back a bit so we could retain our privacy. That's basically it. Thank you. So yeah. it, you said that's Fort Hill Road. That, Wait, Fort Hill, yeah. Driveway. So you probably walked right next to yeah. my driveway there. Yeah. It's essentially kind of along the lines of what was discussed about. Then we can get into it. The open space layout is um, sure. common shared driveways. You know, we required to be along the common boundary, but is this a case where we support the shifting of that so that it's offset? Um, and the question is just to make sure in the past that usually requires a zoning ordinance, a zoning variance, but I believe we can handle it under a conditional use. It's pretty much anything can be waived under a conditional use. Um, that's one thing I think we can all discuss and maybe discuss general support and then might need to just get confirmation on if that does require its own uh, request via conditional use permit or um, I want, I'd like to get it. We can all discuss it as a board too. But. Okay. That's it's just relative to the open space layout. Once we get through the yield plan. All right, is there any other uh, public comment? None. I'll close the public hearing. It, uh, I opened it at 7:35 p.m. I'm closing it at 7:43 p.m. All right, Mr. Barry, uh, rejoin the table. Um, so, do you want to touch upon any of any of those items before we? Uh, um, the, the only comment um, I really don't feel like I need to address anything that was submitted to you in writing uh, that's more of a general um, planning conversation uh, in terms of the comment made by the abutter um, at that turning point I can simply just move the lot line over and we can move the driveway over uh, so that it still straddles the line I split that area evenly with a lot line. It just will mean that that's not evenly split. You know, there, it will favor his side um, a little bit, but we can certainly accommodate that. That's true, because one of the conditional use permits is to request that less frontage anyway, so. That's right. Gotcha. So yeah. that would alleviate the concern potentially of if yep. an additional request is needed. Okay. <clears throat> do you wanna, do we wanna tackle the yield plan and then we'll, um, yeah, I think that makes sense. Might make Is sense. Is there any other comments from the board before we go? To, you know, make a make a decision about the yield plan. If not, let me get to my agenda. <clears throat> so, no, I don't um, think that makes sense to, to make to take action on that. Tonight. Yeah, just to get a formal vote, make sure there's a record of approving the yield plan, kind of locking it, as I, as I like to say. Um, I'll make a motion that we approve the yield plan component of uh, case number 23-004 SUB um, as submitted to the board at 25 lots. A motion by Mr. McKinnon um, to approve the yield plan as submitted. Mm -hmm. I'll second. Second by Mr. Davies. Is there any further discussion? Yeah, so I um, I am concerned about the the 
the Yale, Yale plan showing a road off of Fort Hill um, because of one, the size of the entrance, but also where it's located on that corner um, and just the width of Fort Hill. So I feel two house lots should be removed from the yield plan. And those are the first two houses as you uh, come in to um, off of the Fort Hill. As they, if you could still do the, you can still do the swoop around. Um, and so this, this lot here, um, lot 1110 would remain, but I think lot 1112 and lot 1111 um, wouldn't remain. So the reasoning for that again is because of the current condition of Fort Hill and the curve there, or the, the where where it's located. The the fact that it's 75 feet, you don't have a 50 foot buffer. Where it's located on Fort Hill as you're coming around. So so my point is going back to your point in our terrain review that well they could ask for variances, they could ask for waivers, but I think even if they were to ask for variances and waivers, there's still concern coming off of that corner on Fort, Fort Hill and that, that swoop. So that's just my feeling. So I think the, uh, 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 is there any other comment on the motion? Sure. Charlene, is it a concern Based on traffic on Port Hill there, and well, where so again, the, again, the the lack of buffer, but then also yes, where that's located on Fort Hill, you yes. you come around to yes. that bend. So now, if there was a road coming off there, you've got cars coming down off. Certainly, they there'd be a stop sign there and stuff, but still, that's a pretty sharp corner as you're going around Fort Hill. So, my point is is to get a waiver or. Um, or you know uh, a variance on that I think there's safety concerns on that corner that just and especially a road coming in so close to the adjacent lot um, but I just if I were if I were on the board um, with in looking at a variance on that you know for that I, I wouldn't I would be concerned and I would probably vote against it. Well, didn't we actually experience vehicles like speeding by us when we were coming out of the woods there? And we're like, yeah, people are not used to traffic on this end of the road because. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't do. remember that. But, that but so, you know, th those are my concerns is whether or not that's a viable road coming in off of Fort Hill. So I think the appropriate thing to do is we have a motion uh, with a second, I think is to vote on the motion, depending on what occurs with the motion. Uh, if it passes, then we move forward. If it doesn't pass, then we would look at a second motion or we would have discussion um, you know, beyond that. So I think that's the appropriate course of action on this one. So um, any further discussion on the motion? Say none. So all those in favor uh, of the motion to approve the yield plan as submitted, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed? So the motion does not carry. It fails uh, two to three. So we can continue, we can continue discussion on language. that. So my opinion on, on that is, so if the applicant comes forward and decide to just scrap an open space plan for this and come forward with, with um, a conventional subdivision plan, we would address these items, uh, including setbacks and things of that nature, any variances that may be needed um, in those lots are still oversized, so there's still room in there potentially to change uh, 
know, that road, that road geometry. It's not going to change how the road intersects with the, the existing road. Correct. Uh, correct. So, at that point, the board would have a few options. Offsite exactions um, for road improvements would be would be one that would probably come up, um, especially with the bend in the road right there. Um, I mean, as always, under the purview of the board to reduce lots based on each each plan and, and the specific conditions set to it, but. We definitely have to have, have reasoning for that. Mr. Chair. Yep. So I think, I think the question is whether or not the yield plan is reasonable and appropriate. And I certainly understand the concern if, it, if that area were used as part of a conventional subdivision. Um, but I would also point out that Fort Hill is currently a dead end road. Um, the access in and out of there um, at that length, uh, our connection to that, if we were to actually do the conventional subdivision, would provide an additional level of safety along Fort Hill Road uh, to allow for a second means of access uh, in and out of there. Um, so I think, I think whether or not we provide that access on this yield plan or not i think the question remains whether or not a 25 lot yield is reasonable for this 102 acres um, if the board continues to find that this with that connection is not acceptable then i need to go revise the yield plan the the dead answer is not whether or not we lose one or two units it's how to make the subdivision work if we can do so reasonably with 25 units. Right, for example, like yeah. you did with, on the yield plan, proposed lots 11, 16, 15, and 14, adding a cul-de-sac. Precisely. That's what I was going to jump at. Is in it. theory, a cul-de-sac could be added because you, it would still qualify. You could add a cul-de-sac instead of a connection to Fort Hill. Right. The connection to Fort Hill was made because when we talk about large planning ideals like Fort Hill being a dead end in its current condition, connectivity in your rules sort of talk to connectivity, um, that's why that connection was made. That's why the yield plan was drawn the way it was. Um, if, if another dead end needs to be designed and we have to reshuffle the subdivision on the yield plan, then that's what I need to do. So, I, and you just so I'm understanding what you just said so you're saying well they could just you know off of this road <clears throat> off of this road coming in here yeah. just put another little cul-de-sac right in here or or something so you still have the same lots they're just not coming off of four or, correct so like my saying. so if I'm and I'm using the like as Ed said so um if I the layout here for a lot 11 14 15 16 essentially they could pull back the connection to Fort Hill and there is actual and it would they really wouldn't lose buildable space is that there could be a cul-de-sac installed right after the driveway for 1111 right there you, okay. wouldn't, you wouldn't need it you would just be able to do a shared driveway potentially up and or a shared driveway yeah. yeah so and then uh, additionally I just I just found the language I don't know I should have gone to the website to begin with but um, I think there was a distance thrown out there of 50 feet but we ended up with 25 feet of a no disturb buffer of a new right of way. So I know obviously this plan here, I think the conventional plan shows the right of way encompassing the entire 75 feet, but it actually would accommodate our minimum of 50 feet plus leaving a 25 foot strip for the no disturb. Um, it's not shown that way, but dimensionally it actually would have the, it would be able to meet, because in the rural district it's 25 feet. Um, this is article, this is the new, this was voted on this year, it was new article two, Section 2D, the right of way of all new roads or streets within a subdivision shall maintain a 25 foot no disturb natural vegetated buffer from any property line share with a lot of buddy in the, the subdivision. Um, so I, so then, so, so then I would agree if like, if this, if instead of showing this coming off of Fort Hill, 
if this the, those two lots were either a cul-de-sac or a shared driveway then yeah like then I would be like okay no problem 25 yield so I think if going back to what you said the question is how many not necessarily how you designed it mm -hmm. but how many so I would be comfortable with 25 hearing like there's, I mean, the cul-de-sac way, if you did the cul-de-sac way, that would completely meet the zoning. Right. Layout-wise. Um, well, so would a shared driveway. makes more sense safety-wise. Right. Again, we go to, the, the I think, the board in general is supportive of the yield plan, but also support of the open space layout, which wouldn't have a road. It would be right. two new single-family homes yeah. um, that it. we actually have a little bit more control over in terms of width of mm -hmm. pavement, that kind of stuff, so. And I think this is good. Um, this is great discussion. And, you know, it shows obviously the, the level of diligence on this. And again, you know, so if this yield plan came before us, I mean, there would be a lot of questions that came up for me about that Fort Hill connection. You know, if that was to be built, um, there'd be a lot of you know, tougher questions, ways to make sure that Fort Hill Road was potentially safe to, to potentially deal with any traffic that was coming in. I do appreciate though that the town does try to look for oftentimes two egresses ingresses um, from roads and, and if that was to go to the yield plan and build something there, it would give Fort Hill Road a potential to have that second means of exit, um, making the town in some ways happy for that. But when I look at this, if, if you eliminated that on the yield plan and went with a shared driveway for those two lots, it looks like it's totally, um, totally there. Right. Asking the applicant for me to go back and, and revise the plan to show that, I think, is a lot of expense to. That, yeah, no, I'm that, fine. That, not. I think the discussion and the minutes no. and the, from the meeting will show kind of how how we came to that. Um, yeah. No, I, I'm I'm glad we had it. Happy to make another motion. <laughs> is there any further discussion? Or yeah. Uh, otherwise, yeah, another motion. I have a question on the um, cul-de-sacs. Are they, how wide are they going to be? Will it, do, if there is emergency, because we were just talking about that, and fire and rescue trucks are in the cul-de-sac area, the people to the rear of the cul-de-sac, are they able to get out if they should need to with fire and rescue trucks in the area? Because that's always been in the past. <coughs> A big concern of ours is there not being another way out or a turning radius. So, are we talking about the the open space subdivision design now? Yes, because that's what we're going to be actually. If we approve this and three cul de sacs, what we're going to be going forward with? Oh, yeah. So right now we're, we we. Oh, you mean we're, so? Are you saying in general the cul de sac design? Correct. Yeah, because okay. that's what you were talking about is having another cul-de-sac or added. a shared driveway that you could do off of those two lots. Yeah, right now we're we're just making motion on on the yield plan, the yield. Amount. Right, but having an extra cul-de-sac is part of that yield plan. You're looking to be able to f still fit in 25 homes, correct? Well, or, a driveway, uh, or a shared driveway. Or a shared driveway. Then it would more likely, given this where that is, more uh, I'm assuming more likely it would be a shared driveway. Yeah. Than that they would redesign this <coughs> shared driveway to show that those two lots have access. Um, that would make more sense. But inside. even to the point of the cul-de-sac, I think dimensionally what they're showing on, you know, the two current ones on the yield plan, if we stick with the yield plan, same layout for the open space layout, the cul-de-sac meets the same dimensions, um, is that that is laid out to what the town has said is the, the okay. minimum radius of a cul-de-sac, okay. which is generally kind of I think their plans show it is designed so that a fire truck can turn through it. Um, and then to that point of like people being able to get out, that's the hard part, right? To be able to be like, if somebody at the end needs to get out, unfortunately when there's an emergency, it's kind of hard to design to that. But to that extent for emergency access, we do have a limit of 2,000 feet on um, the length of a dead end road, which there's a lot of NFPA rules that come in general practice and some towns it's 1500 feet some somehow sometimes it's based on the length is based on number of units the Nottingham just has a blank 2,000 feet they do cap you can't do for more than 40 units on an open space layout they're not proposing now to the open space it's a lot of houses to fit on a 
thousand foot long road, but <laughs> somebody thought of it. Um, but I think dimensionally, the cul-de-sacs do meet the road standard, the road layout standard, and certainly the cul-de-sac portions are less than more, a couple hundred feet. Less than yeah, we could definitely get into that again and reconfirm all that with the applicant. Um, you It'll know, come as, up as on open move, space yeah. as we move forward. Okay. Because all that will come up and that'll be part of our third party engineering company's review is road standards and, and everything. If there's nothing else, I'll make another motion. So I'll make a. I'll, Another motion or remotion that we approve the 25 lot yield plan that is a part of case number 23 004 SUB um, as presented. Motion by Mr. McKinnon. Is there a second? I'll second. Ms. Anderson, is there any further discussion? You said as presented, but we've talked about changes to it. So he means you mean in relation to the 25 okay, as lots. presented to 25 lot I mean via the board discussion I think we we talked through I think potentially three options of okay so it's that. just the yield we're not just approving just the, the we're just approving the, the number of lots okay. the 25 the lots. lots because that allows okay the other plans to move forward gotcha. so we're just approving the maximum of 25 lots, it's a maximum under our coordinates. It's a one to one ratio. So. Right. right, there's no density bonus in Nani. We have a motion by Mr. McKinnon, second by Missy Anderson uh, to approve the, the yield plan of 25 lots. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed, uh, motion carries 5 0. Thank you for that. Thank you. Um, so next I, on our list, I think the conditional use permit for the wetland buffer might be good to talk about next. But now, we're looking, um, specifically at the, I don't know if there was a vote taken for the uh, to move forward open space versus Versus conventional, I mean, the board. Do we have purview. to? Do we have to formally make a motion to? It? I guess by approving the yield plan, we're kind of approving that. Do you want to pull that up real quick? Just to make sure we, if we got to take a vote. Uh, well, it's technically yeah, it's not a conditional use. Yeah, I think it just says, uh, at least my I'm reading it that it's understood that if you're going to move forward with the open space, now you're making sure that they comply with specific section and that. So we're going to focus our attention now on the open space plans, and not the uh, not the yield anymore. So all our discussion at this point, we'll we'll go forward to uh, to the design. In review of the design proposed design for the open space subdivision plan um, the one thing I will note though that we just want to make sure it's on here so the last time and we were all fine with that is we didn't make a motion to accept the conditional use permits as submitted because there was that notification it made it onto the notification now yep. so we just didn't take any formal vote we acknowledged that do we have the conditional use permits? We didn't take a motion, a vote to accept them. There's just to um, accept the applications. But just to, I just, yeah, I just want to make sure we, we acknowledge that we have accepted because they've been notified for now. So we probably should vote just to accept those applications, which I believe <coughs> go to Blair's. Blair touched upon. 
Blair did provide some conditional some comments related to the conditional use permits. Um, I think, and I'm just summarizing, this is number three on Blair's staff comments that I think it's seen more so some clarification questions, not to the substance of the application, right? Yeah, I mean, they have the right to ask for it. It's it's you guys to debate. So there really wasn't much for me to put in there, but I just wanted to make sure that. We but is there it. enough to review the applications? I think we, uh, we yeah. should probably vote on just Smith. Has everybody had a chance to actually look through the the, the documents for the conditional use permits itself? No. So the actual application for conditional use permit combines them all into essentially like one review in terms of like answering the questions but then the other document um, uh, there's more of a there's more of a narrative explanation in a, in a memo format yeah so which I think is a little bit clearer on my end but yeah so maybe do we just treat this like application acceptance and if you want to give an overview sure sure yeah So give an overview now, or you want to accept it Yeah, first? do you want to just do an overview of the conditional use permits, a sure. brief one, and then we'll just vote on the acceptance of those to make sure that's reported? Yep. So uh, I'd like to separate them because I think distinctly they're separate in your ordinance. So we're asking for a conditional use permit to impact within 25 feet of a wetland buffer, or within 25 feet of a wetland, which you've now defined as a buffer. Um, that impact is approximately 5,000 square feet in size and is the direct uh, impact due to the installation of a stormwater treatment swale uh, and grading swales to ensure that the stormwater treatment from the impervious surface of the roadway is handled appropriately. Um, I've gone through the conditional use criteria found in the zoning document concerning uh, the 25 foot buffer or the area within 25 feet of the wetland. Um, I've keyed out all of the functions and values uh, that we saw in that area, how we're addressing them, uh, the sensitivity and context to the project site. So it's not enough for us to just ask for impact, just to ask for impact. We have to justify why that impact is needed. Uh, I took uh, some time to go through and justify based on globally the wetland systems on site uh, the impact area of the total project and how that relates then down to the total uh, buffer impact within 25 feet approximately 5,000 square feet um, I point out in my uh, application that this is point um, less than 1% of the project site um, and is clearly less than a fraction of a percent uh, in terms of overall buffer that remains uh, on this site and uh, the surrounding sites and I would just point out as part of my writings, uh, this project as designed has very little environmental impact uh, in terms of wetland impact, direct wetland impact, there is none. Um, buffer impact, there's very little. Uh, we try to design uh, stormwater systems outside of even the 50 foot setback that uh, is required uh, for structures, uh, the 75 foot to very poorly drained soils. We point out in our application uh, where those soils are, why they're important to the, in the context of the site, and why we've designed the site uh, around uh, avoiding those and minimizing those. We basically tried to utilize minimization and avoidance uh, tactics that would be used as part of the wetlands uh, permit uh, as it relates to your buffer. Um, as I pointed out in my application, um, all of the best management practices that we're proposing uh, on site are eco-friendly and by that I mean there are no pro uh, plastic products we try and use all natural products for sediment and erosion control um, so that uh, the critters don't get hung up in the plastic products um, we've tried to utilize uh, the highest and best technology for stormwater treatment systems that we can we've tried to eliminate rock linings and riprap uh, in the context of the sensitive wetland areas um, so we've really tried to design the site um, the best uh, we can using the best management practices available to us uh, today and so that's the uh, proposed conditional use permit for the wetlands permit
in terms of the open space uh, we're asking for or the open space subdivision we're asking for conditional use permits for um, buffers to be less than 100 feet in width I key those out on the plan as to where they are uh, the two frontage lots uh, on Fort Hill Road a small area around Frederick Drive um, where we're proposing some landscaping uh, I think we pointed out at the last planning board meeting why Frederick Drive was placed where it is and then a small area where a proposed uh, rain garden is proposed within 100 feet of a, a perimeter buffer again we're proposing to landscape that and shield that from the budding landowners uh, we're proposing lots that have less than 100 feet of frontage uh, those are on uh, for, uh, Fort Hill Road and we're proposing uh, two lots uh, no three lots in the subdivision that are larger than uh, the maximum um, allowed within a conservation subdivision the most notable are the two off from Fort Hill Road uh, we've tried to make those uh, standard size lots so that they fit the context of the neighborhood uh, quite a bit better we would also point out that given the sort of the jockeying of the boundary lines to get into those building areas much of the area as it incorporates uh, the lot size um, isn't buildable isn't really usable it's good for access um, but not good for tillage or usable land mass around the homes and so we've made those homes larger those are also uh, within the aquifer protection zone and so inherently we want to make those a little larger uh, so that we can make our future impervious surface ratios work um, as well uh, the other two lots in the subdivision that are larger than um, the maximum prescribed which is 45,000 square feet are on Frederick Drive those that's lot 11-24 and 11-23 and again the reason for that is we've strategically placed the building area off the proposed roadway and to gain access to those we've had to sort of neck the lots down the necking portion is not really that buildable or that usable and so we've tried to make the building areas a little bit larger uh, to accommodate for that uh, creative use which your regulations encourage I think that's all the Commissioner use permits so number one was the vegetative buffer around wetland number two is the open space um, is there are permits within the open space uh, subdivision section mm -hmm. of a buffer less than 100 feet and then are you separating out uh, number three being lots of less than 100 feet of frontage uh, in oversized lots or technically okay. four conditional use yeah I guess that's four there's four total there's four total three under the open space article one under the well yeah. 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 so I think some of them may be combined in the CUP but we can address them individually so yeah you can address each component. it's not like a, there's like a variance or something it, it, each piece of it within the permit can issues permit application can be addressed um, and voted on right. is there any uh, further board discussions of what mr. McKinnon was recommending is that we um, I believe is that we act on application completeness first on these like we would any other application and then once that if we find them complete then we can go into further discussion about the merits and potentially make a motion and act upon uh, the conditional use permits being requested So um, uh, obviously the most helpful part for me was having it kind of broken out in memo narrative form, uh, which Mr. Barry just kind of went through. Um, so with that, I'll case number eight. I'll make a motion that we accept the conditional use permits as complete, submitted under case number 23-004-SUB so I motion that they're complete I'll second that's a motion by Mr. McKinnon a second by Ms. Anderson to accept the 
conditional use permits uh, as complete. Any further discussion on completeness of the motion? Uh, seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, that motion carries um, 5 0. All right, so now we can discuss further the actual conditional use permits and take action on them uh, on any, if we decide tonight. Um, it's, that's appropriate. So we'll take them. The wetland impact buffer, I think, would be the first one. That's a. Uh, yeah. So that's kind of a, a dual conditional use permit that. And there's a, a large narrative as to, as to why that's being requested. And then just to confirm plan wise, this is really set call. This buffer impact is for like a treatment swale. It's all at the, the entrance to Peekaboo, correct? Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, it's, yeah, so it's, we have one application for conditional use permit that addresses all those items. Yeah. Um, so we can address that conditional use permit and either make, take action on all items requested, some of the items requested, table things um, as, as appropriate. Uh, but I'll open discussion getting back to the board to these, these items. I think if we're, I mean, I think they're. I agree. Let's start with the wetland buffer. It is a completely separate section than really the request for the other the other three requests, and then sure. discuss it, make a motion if we feel appropriate. And I noticed that uh, as you walked, and, and it's not being impacted, so I don't think the, the setbacks an issue at all. The, the, there was an area that appears to be like an intermittent stream, possibly or first what we call first source stream, um, but you're not you're not touching that now. With, with so if you went back to a conventional, we would have discussion about that and the regulations and everything, but very far away from that. Um, you know, any, any building being proposed is, is, is well away from that. So for when we take action on conditional permits, we do have a, a list of items, and I can read through this for everybody. So specific to the vegetative buffer, uh, I'll address that one first. Conditional use permits um, are allowed for the vegetative buffer as long as it's not around a vernal pool, which this is not being, um, they will only be granted uh, provided that no alternative route, which does not cross wetland or has less detrimental impact to, on the wetland is a feasible, is feasible, and all the following conditions are found to exist. So there's, A through F, and I can read through those to everybody or summarize. Um, Summary. <laughs> where, where are you reading from? I'm reading from, from the zoning ordinance. The yeah. uh, what page of that? Oh, I believe it's page 13. Yeah. 13 is conditional use. And I'm actually in the old okay. version, but we did well, not I was change it. Also the, depends on the version. We did not change the conditions of it, so it's um, the wetland conservation areas mm -hmm. is specifically that that is in. <coughs> That's on page 15. Okay, sorry. I'm on. Wetland conservation area. I think area. he's in the 2022 version. Let me shift some things yeah. around. So it's but the, the, condition, the criteria didn't change. For the, uh, okay. With that, we just added the vegetative buffer. Uh, the proposed construction is essential to the private use of land, not within a wetland conservation area, and the upland area considered for development is not smaller acreage than the wetland area being considered. Designs, construction, and maintenance methods will be such as to minimize detrimental impact upon the wetland. It will include a restoration of the site as nearly as possible to its original grade and conditions. Uh, and again, this is not a direct impact to the wetland. Uh, the Nottingham Conservation Commission has provided comments relative to the value of the wetland under construction design of the proposed project as it relates to the wetland. We do have comments from them. Economic advantage alone is not a reason for the proposed construction. Prior to the granting of the conditional use permit under this section, the applicant shall agree to submit performance security to ensure all construction is carried out in accordance with an approved design. Um, so basically, that's a bond. And and I think that's gonna would be captured under any final approval would be bond would would be we require roadway bonds uh, in this town. Uh, the planning board may require the applicant to submit environmental impact assessment when necessary to evaluate the application made in this section. That's it. So A through F. So I think we have two things we can 
act on this specific part of the conditional use permit. And, um, and if we do, we just want to make sure we address you know, those criteria in, in anything. And again, uh, Mr. Barry, can you, can you just again point out near, right near which lot is that being proposed? Is that your buffer? It's, it's at the entrance of Peekaboo, yeah. so it's not really near a lot, but um, the closest lot is 11-17 and maybe 11-1. Yeah. So it's as you enter Peekaboo and it's on the uh, right side, um, and it's for the grading of a treatment swale within the 25 foot buffer. Yeah. You can see where the 50 foot setback sort of overlaps and then there's no space in between. We've tried to strategically place the road in the center of that. So there is no alternate route for an entrance into there. Is that what you're saying there? Any, would it require direct impact? Any alternate route would require much larger additional direct impact. Even coming in up here. That's not good. Mm -hmm. it's all, those are private homes. So based on a frontage at least. I think to your point, it might just make sense just to pop through, go A through F, and just say if anybody has any questions that it doesn't meet those criteria, it's probably the best way to do it. Yeah. Some of them don't require as much discussion as others. Um, oh. uh, criteria A is the so could proposed construction is a for productive use of land not within that conservation area. Yep. And the big, the important here thing is the specifics of the upland area considered for development is not smaller acreage-wise than the wetland area acreage-wise being considered. Um, there's certainly, just looking at the plan, you can tell there's a lot more upland area than wetland area. So if you look at it, a literal interpretation, it, it there truly is quite a bit more percentage-wise upland area. So I guess my opinion is that it would meet criteria. A, and again, partially because direct impact to the wetlands is being avoided um, due to the upland throat, per se, through the wetlands, there's the need to impact the 25-foot buffer with associated storm. Um, B, design construction and maintenance shall such as to minimize detrimental impact on the wetland and into restoration of the site. I think we've seen there, there are erosion control plans in here. I'd say that yes, they're shown adequate measures to control erosion uh, sediment runoff. Um, and it's being utilized to create a swale to, to make sure that runoff of that area is, is, is directed appropriately to a treatment. Correct. Area. Yeah, correct. Right now, it, it would divert runoff to a proposed treatment feature. Uh, C is met. We have the, the, the comments from the CONCOM. Con correct. And I believe it was, they kind of had a short statement there, right, that they supported the request. They reported the CUP. They supported this uh, CUP request. Economic advantage alone um, is not a reason for the proposed construction. So. You know, it kind of goes back to, you know, the yield plan is 25 lots. Overall, we're still at 25 lots. Um, I tend to look more at direct impacts with in terms of economic impact. Um, and I would say it's, it's not alone, meaning, meaning that would mean that there may be an alternative way to get in here, access it, but they're choosing this because um, it may be cheaper because it might have been the shortest distance to get in. But when you look at the lot, in the proposed roadway location, this is the most feasible and minimizes any impacts. Um, the buffer 
as opposed to trying to shift that road anywhere else you'd have most likely direct wetland impacts instead. E, I would agree with you. That is, if, if the conditional use permit's approved, it's just a, outlines how a, a surety needs to be provided. And can it be included in the final conditions? And then F, we received um, environmental assessment really of the wetlands, uh, you know, they, they went existing, proposed, wetland by wetland, um, very thorough, so. I think a motion on this section is, is in order. Let's see if I can get the section right. And I think, uh, I'm just, I'm using Belair's as kind of a guide because I think originally it had been submitted under Article 3, B2, but that going off the newest 2023 formatting, uh, I think there was some shifting there of numbers. So number three is now vegetated buffers. So I'll just clarify. So that's going to be um, just to correct everybody, and I'm just confirming the number here. So that's going to be uh, this this section of is actually Article Three, subsection B, number three, subsection little b. Um, so I'll make a motion to approve the conditional use permit uh, for case number 23-004-SUB relative to Article 3B3B uh, disturbance within the 25-foot wetland buffer that's not a vernal pool. Second that. We have a motion by Mr. McKinnon, a second by Ms. Anderson. Uh, is there any further discussion on that? All those in favor, please say aye. All those opposed, that motion carries 5 0. Thank you for that. And I'd say that if we have your findings of fact, it's easier just to do it now. Yep. Uh, was we found that the conditional use permit application for this section that was just mentioned uh, did meet the criteria as outlined up within our zoning ordinance of uh, conditional uses and A through F um, with the condition that E would be met when if final approval is granted the bond uh, for this would be included in the, in the roadway bond. Okay. So that's that. So then we have the next part would be um, we can either tackle this in pieces or as a whole, permit lots larger than the maximum, uh, allow frontages less than prescribed and allow a reduction to the landscape buffer. So this goes into the open space subdivision area and I don't believe that gives us a uh, Necessary checklist. Um, Your ordinance. There is a thing. Provides for a conditional use uh, criteria. Such modification shall be consistent with the purposes and objectives of this section. All lots shall comply with NHDES environmental services for subsurface disposal. All lots shall fall within the standards uh, here contained shall not be detrimental to public health, safety, or welfare. That's under uh, number seven under the OSD mm -hmm. section, so it's page 35 on that. Yep. Most current version of the zone plus minus one, depending on the version you have, I guess. <laughs> yeah. All right, so I think the first one, at least on this list, is um, section eight, article article four, section eight A. S eight A. That's where the dimensional standards for the open space development are requiring 100 feet uh, of frontage. Dot two dot A. Yeah, it's section eight two A. Eight dot two. 
Yeah, but where is the subsection two on that? There isn't. Oh. Was this another reformatting? I'm just seeing section eight, which is standards and conditions under the article. Right, that's why I would say it's S S S eight B. S eight B. S eight B is alternative lot sizing. Yeah. So that's for that is one of them. But section Well isn't all right, sorry. If that's I mean, in theory, they could ask for 8A for both because the 150% the max is also called out in that table, that general dimensional table. Right. That's but what, but 8B does specifically talk about, and that's what we'll get to, is alternative lot sizing as long as it complies with NHDS requirements. Um, but at least from the frontage, I think the only place it's really called out is 8A, which is the dimensional uh, dimensional requirements under the OSD law. Minimum frontage of 100 feet. And this is just specifically for the Fort Hill lots. Mm -hmm. Correct? Right? Lots. lots. Lots, right? Two lots. Two lots on Fort Hill. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I think my only comment is based on what was presented. Um, I obviously support having just two homes with access here versus. A roadway a potential roadway connection um, if that was pursued and that additionally based on what was presented it was uh, the lot line was split down the existing 75 foot uh, really it's kind of a right-of-way short right-of-way connected to Fort Hill is that the only thing I'd like to suggest is that as part of this we request a shift I mean, we can talk numbers, but I'd, I'd like to see that lot line shifted where the lot number is in front of me. Lot 1119, 1118. So I'd I would like to see, just from a general layout perspective, that lot 18's frontage actually be reduced, shifting that shared lot line. The idea being that. Um, we're shifting that shared driveway away from the abutting property. Um, I thought about, you know, I always like to think about, well, there's another abutter, but if you look at that, it's actually not buildable land mm -hmm. um, in that corner of that lot because there's a, a roadway that's not going anywhere. There's, they're abutted on three sides by something. I mean, there is something there now, but it's been there quite some time. So that's the only thing. I mean, that doesn't really change the scope. They're still needing. They still need a request for the 100 foot frontage. Um, but if it's supported and voted on, maybe just consider how far you'd like to move that over, just so we can. Because there were some existing trees that save as many as possible. Um, there's always going to be that opening unless we require trees or something like that. But that opening is going to be there. And I think it was at one point it was the abutting lot. Whoever owned it. It was cleared and it's been maintained. It's cleared. So what are we looking at for frontage versus 100? What is it going to be? Uh, each lot has 37.51 feet of frontage. I'm sorry? Each lot has 37.51 feet of frontage. 37.5? 5. Mm -hmm. 1. 1 instead of the 100? Yes. And so it's more along the lines of our it would kind of follow up. We use like a back space. Back, back, back lot is what we call it. Um, we have a back lot subdivision section. No, I know. I mean, I mean, you guys have probably you've probably reviewed some more of those requests at the zoning board level. I believe that. And that is a shared driveway being proposed. Of course, course. lots. Oh, of course. Yes. And the easement for that is provided in the plan set. What what road is the frontage on? Fort Hill Road. Ah, so it's that little neck that sticks out. Okay. Yeah, it's a seventy-five foot. Mm -hmm. Right here. Fort Hill Road. Yep. That's what I was trying to figure out. I want to make sure I have the right number. Twenty feet. Twenty. 
So in a back that's lot, that's so a, this is where I, I think I'm somewhere in my mind is, is are we going, if, if this were approved in this scenario, were we, are we going below our lowest, which in, in this case is a back lot subdivision, and, that, and that's a 20 foot um, frontage curb cut. Yeah. So that would just be a consideration for the shifting of the line if we approve the less than 100. I, I would like we can specify. I would likely kick the angle of the line, keep the frontage point the same, and kick the angle of it. Sure. <clears throat> but I, mean, I guess in general, I like having this as. I, I always think a big picture is if they did not propose these two lots here. Um, I know they're proposing open space somewhere else, but it's not to say that you know it currently has, I think, some leg in getting approved as a roadway connection. Obviously, there's some relief applied there, but mm -hmm. by approving this, we're saying okay, there's two residential lots. Right. This big nice. piece of land can not put more than that because there's now no other avenue to get to more than these two lots via shared driveway. Right. Um, and just looking at what Fort Hill is now, or what's left over for land, there really isn't, this is kind of the last accessible piece of large land with any connection to Fort Hill. My thought always though, is going back to who gets the land. You've, you've taken away road frontage on them. And it isn't a back lot subdivision. Right. It's an actual home on a, on a piece of land. I, if it doesn't meet, then it doesn't meet, and you shouldn't have two. That's my opinion. I just like we're like going for all of these changes to make it all fit instead of going, what does the property support? So, and I find that wrong. Go ahead, answer me. Uh, <laughs> well, I wait to be recognized by the chair. I'm sorry I vocalized. I think it's important. I don't disagree with you. Okay, good. <laughs> I, I, I understand. I, I do. Un, fundamentally, I understand your point of view. We're here asking for relief from an ordinance to allow us to be creative to develop the property the best way possible. No, and I don't agree with that. Well, that's why I'm sitting here. I'm, <laughs> I'm telling you that. Okay. If we were to not utilize these this area in the fashion that we're asking to, we would either extend the roadway on Peekaboo and have additional impact there, or we would extend Frederick out where we would then need direct wetland impact. So when we designed this subdivision, we did it in the context of the entire parcel and what's good for the entire land. Uh, also looking at, obviously these people uh, want to develop their property, but we're here trying to do it in the best way possible, the most environmentally friendly way possible and the, from a standpoint, from a large planning standpoint, what makes the most sense? Um, in terms of whether or not this lot has 100 feet of frontage, 37.51 feet of frontage, or 20 feet of frontage, these lots are gonna share an access into the property, they're gonna branch off, and then they're gonna have multiple acres to themselves. Um, so it creates a very secluded, nice uh, lot uh, in an area that's pretty well um, shielded from further development. So I just wanted to express why we designed this entire plan the way we did. Never mind. Anyway. No, it doesn't matter. So we do have, is there any further discussion on this or um, I would recommend that we tackle each piece separately. Um, so the lot uh, right now we're talking about frontage less than prescribed versus the uh, unless it didn't build so it's differently I, I, I would recommend that we separately we, we tap each piece of the issue from it separate yep just like waivers I think I'll just add to it too just kind of the fine line is that there is an alternative to adding I'm sure there's a way to fit two additional lots on Peekaboo, extending the road line, um, 
still complying with our maximum length, that I think there's concerns always of trying to minimize the number of lots on these new roadways. Um, some people look at it as, well, you just focus all of your development on one and leave a huge piece untouched, but at the same time, I think it's, you're trying to create new neighborhoods. You want to balance the number of homes first. And, and two homes can make a difference. So I really do like that, um, you know, it's just not to say that they could go without these two lots, get an approval. It doesn't mean that somebody can't come back. You can, you can let your approval lapse. I, I'm in support of trying to limit the future impact to Fort Hill here while still being within that 25, you know, lot max that we've agreed is what's, what's been presented to us. So I look at it as kind of, I mean, there's a lot of concern about the impact to Fort Hill, and I think there's all potential alternatives that would be more impactful than two single family homes um, with much larger lot areas than most lots on, yeah, I, lots I, on Fort Hill. I think for me, uh, a shared driveway is a whole lot better than a road Yeah. Um, off of here. Um, you still have a hundred foot buffer around the abutters in addition to, you know, one, one driveway. So, you know, and it doesn't add any additional service requirements to the town. So, you know, it's, by the looks of it, it's going to be two nice houses that fit kind of within, you know, back off the road, pretty private kind of fit with the character of, you know, a lot of houses in Nottingham. My question would be, does, why doesn't this require a variance? The good question, uh, I'll speak to my understanding of it and I'll let Mr. Haney also wants to jump in too. So the way the open space subdivision section is written, it mentions basically that that any section, any portion of it can, uh, can issue, a condition use permit can apply to any of the, uh, any of the items within it. Within anything on the zoning ordinance, not just that section. Correct. It, it, right, because the open space subdivision carves out this piece of it from, towards the zoning ordinance to a degree, but the, um, it goes back to the uh, procedural requirements or the um, <coughs> applicability. Because I had that question as well. Do, you know, do, do, do would that require variance or, or not? But the condition use permit is basically a step that keeps it within the planning board's purview um, of that section. And where where was it? Yeah, and under the procedural requirements, it's a 7B authorization to issue a conditional use permit. It's kind of like the catch all to see yeah, under that is uh, <coughs> not seeing other provisions of the Nottingham Zoning Ordinance. Author authority is hereby granted. The planning board is allowed uh, to issue a conditional use permit to modify the requirements of this section as follows. Such modifications shall be consistent with the purpose and objectives of this section. All lots shall comply with NHDES subservice management. All lots shall fall within the standards contained herein and shall not be detrimental to public health, safety, or welfare in the event of a conflict is found to exist between any provisions of the open space development and the other provisions of zoning ordinance. Provisions of open space sub uh, development ordinance shall control and prevail. So I guess the only thing that hangs me up on that, into Mr. Davies' point, is um, is F of that. All lots shall fall within the standards contained herein. And eight is standards and conditions, and A is the lot size and frontage. Um, but then B is alternative lot sizing. Um, allows us may authorize variations for the minimum lot sizes specified above. Have a 
goods are encouraged to ferry lot size and lot dimensions and location of building envelopes. Are you getting at the letter under Section 8 does not specifically mention I don't think that that letter the section in general talks about the conditional use permit, though, under the procedures of the section of the OSD. Right, right. procedural requirements of number seven. Right. That 7F is that all lots shall fall within the standards contained herein. Right, but and those eight is the standards and conditions. Um, so it's a valid question. And, uh, you know, we haven't had my knowledge request for the specific piece of, of the open space subdivision before so the board can move forward and make a motion one way or the other on it we can make a motion to you know request council review um, and input on that uh, it's the board's board's purview if there's any apprehension to the applicability in terms of specifics of the ordinance where some of these to your point do call out uh, you know eight B eight bearing lot sizing eight G which is one of the other landscape buffer requirements that does mention there's anybody voting on the board that's unsure of where eight a does not, which is where the frontage is. If that does not specifically, the others do. I guess I'm confused why <clears throat> doesn't like why some would and some not mention a conditional use permit under some of these sub letters. Right, like we say, lot sizing. You know, is frontage considered a lot sizing? Well, I, so, but. I also would point out that those. They only mention the potential for conditional use permit in those subsection letters if there's specific numbers within it, um, which is kind of odd. So, for example, the D lots may be irregular in size and shape, provided they conform to the natural topography and features of the parcel. That's just a general statement, that's not a dimensional thing, but yet some of the subsections that do have dimensional criteria and hard numbers do mention. More of a confusing thing, I guess, in terms of how you interpret the, the ordinance. I think I've always, when I, I've read this ordinance a couple times and I've always, that, that kind of catch-all there, the seven, the authorization to issue a conditional use permit, and yes, there's some criteria, so either you need an interpretation or um, that inherently is almost contradicting itself where we're saying you can issue a conditional use permit but then within the criteria that we explain we say well it has to comply <clears throat> then there'd be really no reason to request a conditional use permit if we're inherently within it saying it must comply because that's what the request is from literal inter uh Interpretation. Planning board encourages applicants to be flexible in the site layout design to accomplish soil conditions, topography, natural features, and the characteristics of the land, and may authorize variations from the above standards, except for any requirements provided by state regulations or mandated elsewhere in this ordinance by condition use permit. Issued pursuant to section five for the purpose of providing flexibility in the design of the subdivision to meet the objectives of the section. And section five is the use. So, Mr. Chairman, that was what I was going to point out, is that all through this ordinance, it basically implies that the planning board has the platitude or latitude to modify it to ensure that the best plan is brought forward. And that's my interpretation, because I think that's how, that's how previous applications have also been reviewed under the OSD when I looked back at them.
I guess I'd hate to, if somebody has a question on it, I'd hate to push a motion of any kind through. But. Yeah, fine, one way or the other, you know, again, it's the board's purview to decide on either making a motion about the thing, make a separate motion about something you know, for council, or it's the board's purview. So this is not something that we can send to the ZBA for a variance on. Well, the conditional use permit side of it is a kind of like a keeps the purview keeps it, here. Keeps the purview within the planning board to a degree to avoid having but, to go down. But if to there's the a question in the way that the regulation is written, yeah. is that a possible way around it? Um, I think before we did that, I would I would go to town council first to, to see if that's even an appropriate. Then thing. that's then I think before we vote on this, we ought to have town council give us an opinion. That's my that's my feeling because I'm not a, a lawyer and I didn't write the the regulation, so I'm not sure what it means. Like I said, I think if there's enough, if there's even one or two of us that are on the board sure. that are questioning it. I think my, I have my interpretation that I think it's, yeah. the, there's a general blanket statement there that it applies to all, but I also don't want to push it on anybody now, or again, we're not lawyers. Yeah. I think in, in, in the past, this board has always tried to be conservative in that we don't want to step on the toes of another board, meaning if it's really the purview of the DBA, we don't want to accidentally take action in, in which could be then appealable uh, and delay things further. So we, we usually try to be a little conservative in that. We try to ask for legal guidance first to get, make sure that, okay, yeah, we've already received guidance and we say, yep, it's ours or no, it is a, you know, it is a variance and then we take action at that point one way or the other. Um, so hearing the discussion with the board, you know, that'd be my, dis my recommendation, I guess, at this point is, is there's enough, enough question just to make sure that specific to this, this section, the way we've written it, we basically, does the CUP grant us authority to waive every single piece of it um, within the area, or are there still sections of it that would require variance? I think it's specifically the permit. We don't even have to refer to section eight pieces. I think it's more of how is that Section 7B, authorization issue condition permit, but then <coughs> it appears to be somewhat conflicting under 7F, which is technically a criteria under by which the grant the yeah. condition use permits granted. Sure. But also 8E, where the planning board encourages applicants to be flexible in a site layout and design to account for soil conditions, topography, natural features, unique characters of the land and may authorize variations from the above standards, meaning the ones we're talking about, except for any required provided by the state, state regulation or mandated elsewhere in the ordinance by a conditional use permit issued uh, pursuant to Section 5. So I think that Section E specifically gives you authority to modify anything you want about this ordinance. Well, yeah, and I think the eight, question eight is through E or kind of that's that's where it's sticky. Seven B and F versus eight B through E. So, right. in theory, Section Eight should be subsequent because Seven establishes how. So it's almost like in Eight E, there's a description there of that should really be in terms of applicability. Yeah. So I guess I, I, I guess with that, I think there's enough consensus here that sure. on this portion of to make sure we're interpreting. This one was less clear in terms of the conditional use permit under the OSD. Um, I'll make a motion then that we request town council opinion uh, relative to Article 4, Section S, the open space development section, specifically um, subsection 7, and how to confirm applicability of what a conditional use permit can be requested from. So I'm sure you get the language in there in terms of there's multiple potentially conflicting interpretations in subsequent sections. Some specify can issue use permits, some don't. We have a motion by uh, Mr. McKinnon. Is there a second? I'll second it. Second by Mr. Davies. Uh, is there any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed, that motion carries 5-0. So, so, 
So that means this section of the conditional use permit will obviously action on it will be continued to a date and time certain, which we'll determine tonight uh, as we go through the, the case. So that specifically is really the 100 foot frontage, right? Because that's not explicitly called out in 8A. 8B, which is greater than 150% of the lot size, and 8G, those do specifically call out the conditioning. So I think there's less question there as to if a conditioning use permit. So I don't know if the board, if the consensus is we hold off on those or we're just trying to get the interpretation I mean, it's, regarding it's, the 100. Because it's a lot, those are clear. They say specifically in those sections a conditioning use permit can be required, yeah. requested. And so we, I think what Mr. McKinnon is indicating is, you know, do we take, have further discussion and potentially take action on the other two pieces of this about uh, lot size and uh, landscape buffer or do we kind of table this discussion to continue it to another date and time certain to address this whole section of the condition use permit that's been applied for. I, well, it it kind of depends on what the lawyers say about the question. If they say that, uh, that uh, a conditional use permit can't be applied to the frontage, then that means that that something's got to be changed in this whole design. So it makes no sense to approve the lot size right variation right now. Well, lot size does apply to two non, uh, two other lots not on Fort Hill. So you, the Fort Hill lots are what the frontage request is for. Right. And they're also graded 150 percent, but they're under the 150 graded the initial use permit to exceed 150 percent is also two lots on Frederick. So that potentially would go unchanged. Um, does that make sense? So like even if they pulled the Fort Hill lots out, they would still need a request for the 100, exceed the 150. I just, I would rather know that we're making the right move in the first place. That's my opinion. So you suggest that we table action on the second portion of the condition use permit, which is the, the, the area that pertains to Article 4, Section S. You like to make a motion towards that? <laughs> to, to, I would say. Why do we need a motion? To table it, to continue it? Well, we've accepted the application, so it, it's, um, and we're talking about the condition use permit portion, so I think saying that we're going to continue it to a date and time certain, which will be, we'll decide at, at the end of the meeting. Um, I think it will be our next meeting, as long as that works with the applicant. But I don't want to set a date and time now, unless. So if, if there's obviously going to be continuance on this case and certain items of it, our next date is June 10th. Mm -hmm. Is that date a date that works for you or? Um, likely not. Sorry, not June 10th. June, June 14th? Yeah, yeah whatever the second meeting is. is June 28th? Yeah, because we still don't have CMA comments. I'd like to get those. I'll show those you have to submit next week. I, it, yeah. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. And I'm not going to be able to address your two gentlemen's comments between now and next week and get CMAs and deal with that. So. And I think you did address quite a bit of my comments. So mine were yeah. uh, mm -hmm. comments were we picked off quite a bit of them mm -hmm. um, during the initial meeting and then additional tonight. So mm -hmm. I appreciate that. So I guess to Mr. Davies' point, instead of saying table, we would continue, continue. Uh, action on the condition use permit to June 28th at 7 p.m. A motion? No, I, 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 <laughs> I avoid motions as much as possible, Mr. Chair. I'll make a motion then to continue the conditional use permits relative to um, Article 4, Section S, uh, Open Space Ordinance, those three conditional use permits to June 28th, 7 p.m. Is there a second? I'll second it. That's a motion by Mr. McKinnon, a second by Mr. Davies to continue. Um, the conditional use permit application portion for Article 4, Section S to June 28th at 7 p.m. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. All opposed, that motion carries 5 0. All right, so where does that leave us for tonight? If we want to discuss waivers. That yeah, that's what I was going to suggest. Uh, even if the board doesn't take action on them, I'd like to at least hear comments regarding them. I would prefer you take action on them, of course, but I do have notes on them. I understand that it's nine o'clock already. 
So we have, yeah, thank you everybody. It's a, so we've had waiver request for road design standards, uh, waiver permit to widen the road by two feet with the installation of curbing. Uh, explanation of people who drive, uh, I just want to make sure that's the first waiver. Yes. Okay. Yep. People who drive proposed a slope granite curbing adjacent to the gravel wetland and below to direct flow to a proposed treatment swale. This is only proposed on one side and it's for a small section of the road is designed design is not widened in this area as the regulations seem to require. The applicant's narrative was to justification. Uh, and I can read through those if, if anybody would like. Start one by one. The, the gist of this waiver is um, instead of trying to force a swale against the side of the road where we have a back berm for a pond, we've elected to install a piece of um, a stick of curbing uh, so that the pond finishes out at the top of curb. That curb is then directed to the entrance to the treatment swale so that the water coming off from that area can then be treated. Um, your regulations, the way they're written, they, they assume that you would have curbing on both sides of the road. And if you have a 20 foot travel way with curbing on both sides, there's a visual and operational narrowing effect that takes place there because you don't have a shoulder. Um, and so it requires that the roadway be widened because of that. Um, I think geometrically it would look very odd to only widen one section of a roadway for a very short stint by two feet on one side. I think that in itself would be confusing to drivers more so than uh, what it's trying to uh, achieve. Yeah, and if this was a through road, I think I'd feel quite a bit differently in that. I think of Freeman Hall where you right. know, there's a section where yes. the walls go off the road in the curve um, because it's a, it's a through road versus uh, the public being proposed. I mean, only people that live there would be riding it mostly, obviously, the delivery and visitors and things too, but and I do appreciate that there's not a waiver request being asked for for granite versus bituminous. Uh, I think the granite holds up a lot better. Yes. And visually, uh, much more appealing. But, but overall, it just holds up better than the other side. So Mr. McKinley, you said you had some comment? On, on yeah, this mine actually, I was hoping to I think before we take action on this one, we'd have to actually jump ahead to request number four, oh, just because it swales. Because yeah. approval of the waiver request for number four, that's where I had some questions as to like what the set of it requires. They're requesting that, I don't know if you want to jump ahead, but permit people drive to be able to swale lines that exceed 10%. Um, and then exceed 250 in length. And I think, at least based on my interpretation, that the subdivision ordinance, because of the slope of the road, would require curbing on X number of feet of the road, which then obviously is a larger scope of curbing and then brings more into question of looking at the curbing as a whole. So I don't know, I don't want to jump ahead, but I think those two kind of give you actually approach number four first because it involves potential curbing so the subdivision road is designed at 10 percent which is the maximum allowed in your uh, regulations mm -hmm. you have within your regulations in the drainage section it talks about not having swales exceed 10 percent uh, for longer than 200 or 250 feet we clearly have uh, swales that extend well beyond that because we have a roadway that extends well beyond that in that percentage so what we've done to accommodate that uh, and accommodate other issues that we've found in other built subdivisions is we've made the swale wider. Uh, so it's a three foot wide swale. It's deeper, it's three feet deep, and that allows for a proper size culvert uh, to be placed, 18 inches in this case, as we specified in the plans, uh, with proper cover uh, to be placed over it. And um, we're proposing lining of that swale line. If you were to have a 10% swale for more than 200 feet or 250 feet and apply only the minimum standard to your swale requirements, then you would have issues uh, in those swales. Uh, I've submitted to you that um, our analysis identifies this as, a, as an appropriate method to ensure that velocities stay 
uh, appropriately, that uh, your volumetric constraints within the cross section of the swale are appropriate, and that the erosive uh, nature of the water flowing through it are, is also controlled. As Ian pointed out, the alternative to a swale this length uh, for this slope uh, is to essentially curb both sides of the road. Yeah, so just so the board knows, so the waiver request is from 15.6.7, which is roadside drainage, um, specifically number four under that, um, ditches. And then the next section is 15.6.8, curbing, um, and I'll read the what I read that kind of raised the flag for me was number one under curbing is curbing may be required by the following locations at the board of in the following locations if the board determines their application is appropriate in the village district that doesn't apply here for major access roads for residential subdivisions or oh, for intersections with arterial or collector roads and this is the part that I think applies potentially is on any road that exceeds 8% grade or 6% grade when the developed length exceeds 250 feet. So this would apply. So I also think that just to cover the bases, if the board was in support of the ditch approach, I think we would also need to see a waiver request for point A curbing just because they kind of go, kind of, if, if we're approving one, we need the waiver from the other. So um, I guess, again, that's probably the, the, the kind of, does that make sense? It's kind of a, Yep. It all has to do with the road percentages, so. Um, the length. The length. Right, they'd be, the they'd length be proposing a ditch instead of a curb. Correct. Yeah. So 15.6.8 require, would require curbing on a road of this length at this percentage. You know, on the inside of that, that they were, and maybe I'm jumping backwards, that you were saying it didn't make sense to miss it on the road because, or add curb on both sides because you get that, that subconscious narrowing. Right. You're still planning to do the, the shoulder that they talked about, like it was two foot gravel shoulder. Uh, it's three foot, yes. Yeah. Yep. I would also point out that we've designed the roadway wider than the standard. Uh, the standard actually calls for 18 feet and three foot shoulders. Uh, we've designed a, a, a full 20 feet with the three foot shoulders that are required. And having an inside curb that's not curved and instead has a widened shoulder, it would be, I can see, being better for large vehicles, like fire apparatus, right. they hit that if they're coming down a hill. Mm -hmm. So the number one, we talked about number one is hand in hand with number four. Uh, I think Mr. McKinnon's indicating this may need to be modified. I think it would. We just need an additional one. I think it would require, if we approve number four, in, it would almost concurrently have to be inherently we're approving a waiver request from the curbing requirement. They kind of approving one. We can't disapprove. Basically, if, if they did submit a waiver request for the curbing requirement and we shot that one down, there'd be con two conflicting approvals on the waiver, which I don't think is good practice. So that's why I want to make it known that if you inherently approve the, I guess the request on ditches, um, I think we would need to also. Yeah, I guess what I'd like to do is you know get through it, get through the questions, potentially identify that there may be another waiver that's needed. But I would avoid taking action on these until we get our our engineering firm to review because they're gonna they're gonna be part of what they're looking at and these are very technical in my <laughs> in my uh, road coverage my point of view. Like that, yeah. So awaiting that that comment, make sure that we can you know incorporate anything um, or that there's not something overly detrimental is good. So I think we should continue to go through them, but yep. await action on these until we have that review. So. Number two at, uh, was, again, 115.2.1. For my people who drive, be built with a reverse curve containing a tangent less than 100 feet. 
um, number three, same section, to permit the vertical curve entering the cul-de-sac to be less than 80 feet in length, 75 feet is proposed. On Peekaboo Drive, four is from section 15.6.7, roadside drainage, number four, which we just discussed. Five, 15.6.7, uh, roadside drainage, number six, permit the project to be built with flared in sections instead of head walls. Uh, number six, uh, from section 19.3, well radius placement to permit well radii to be off the lot for which they serve. And I knew that came up at the last discussion and uh, at the last hearing, public hearing on this. Um, I did want to point out in our subdivision regs, in our open space, the use of the open space area allows for septic systems and wells um, but it just can't be calculated within the within the uh, in the open space amount and then find that section again it's number you mean that it comes out of what's considered open space right so if you have a sl uh, sliver of well raised that extends into the open space, you've got to subtract X number of square feet from your, yep. your total percentage. Yeah, so like the stormwater management system structures, those those can't count towards the designated open space. Um, it's number nine, commercial uses of open space C. The, uh, Thirty percent of the designated open space may be transferred to common area permitted by condition use permit to be used as for the following. The planning board may impose specific criteria or restrictions on such uses as deemed necessary to support the goals of the section. Uh, number four: individual or community wells provided that this use was approved as part of the subdivision plan and that appropriate legal arrangement are established and approved by the planning board for the maintenance and operation of these facilities. So again, they're not actually. I didn't see any proposed lot where the well is proposed off the lot into the open common area it's the well radius <coughs> and so is, is it appropriate to request the waiver request where the condition where the OSD section actually addresses it I guess I don't know which well, I think by nature of our, almost by nature of our lot sizes <coughs> so you end up with that happening on the OSD. I feel like that's been the case on on these in the past I just want to make sure that it's discussed in the OSD because I know it's, it, it could be a standard waiver under the subdivision regulations but does because it's discussed in the OSD does that supersede this and should require a conditional use permit because or I think prior one from Mr. Davis may have is would it normally it would be a variance when the lot when the well radius goes off the lot because it's in the zoning uh, because it's open open space subdivision can we is a waiver or a conditional use permit applicable? Yes, yeah, we make sure the right things. Are, yeah. Well, it's it's not a variance because it's in your subdivision regulations. Oh, I apologize. I it was in there. But I think I, guess, I think the only time correct. the OSD overrides that is when we're utilizing the open space for that purpose. We're not using we're not utilizing the open space for that purpose. Right. Yeah. <clears throat> Doing that would not put you over. Or Put you under your your well. I know the project well exceeds the required. Right. So I don't, okay. I don't think I don't think it's I don't think the CUP portion of it is required. But I was trying to find. I thought in prior OSDs that were here that that was pretty typical where the well race would go off the back. Um, again, so maybe a, a waiver, simply a waiver request. Yep. And that we did talk about. <coughs> I believe it was to the the fact of. They do go off the lot, but it's still inherent. It's still within the limits of the overall. It is within the open space. It does not go onto an abutting property, which is then a larger issue. Right. And would require additional relief. Right. At the state level as well. Um, so that. So those are the waivers we have at the moment. Six requested. Um, potential for a seventh. We'll see. Potential for a seventh. So is there any further discussion on these? Again, I, my. Thought is that we 
hold off on action on these so we have our third party engineering review back which we should definitely have before well before the, uh, the next meeting now I'm gonna ask for them to have a deadline at least two weeks in advance of that if, uh, it'll be much sooner but obviously the applicant needs to get you a chance to review it we need a chance to review it and if, if any changes are coming out of it uh, definitely needs some time to be able to make those so other discussion I don't want to force okay. a vote if table want table these yeah. for uh, for tonight. But we just, we did want to make sure we got through them, and I think Mr. McKinnon pointed out there's a few things potentially for another waiver being added um, so that they can have that in the next in the next meeting. That was one of my comments was normally anytime anytime the drainage structure and i think we did this on a couple of other subdivisions whether they're open space or not was if there's a buffer or anything like that trying to ensure that if there's a drainage structure there which i understand sometimes the most appropriate point might be where the two roads connect is that we don't lose that buffer capability of, of shielding um, i think one of the, the comments i've heard the most about open space subdivisions is some that were done initially when they were i think cluster subdivisions and, and they weren't vetted out very well uh, meaning the character was a lot different than what they were abutting so I'm thinking of I don't want to point out you may feel bad but Rocky Hill off, uh, um, off Fletch Farm Road yeah. the house is right there and, and you can see it there's no buffer so there's a pond, trying to make sure that there's a, a pond, the, the right pond is kind of right there the drainage structures right there so try to make sure that the plans to come forward where a drainage structure is there, trying to try and make sure that somehow it's captured in there of a condition or whatever else that there's enough visual uh, buffering from the neighborhood to, to you know from the edge of the neighborhoods. So I think again what I've heard over time and it's not about this case was you know I think when people have uh, open space subdivisions in mind it's oftentimes we have some that were done one way, but we have some others that were done very well. And uh, thinking of Francesca, um, that area, don't see anything. we don't see anything from, from 152 or whatever mm -hmm. it's, yeah, until you get in there and it's got its own look and mm -hmm. you know, it's done in a much different way. So, mm -hmm. again, we'll, we'll talk more about that as we get in there. And I know you have a new narrative and you discussed it a bit mm -hmm. earlier tonight. Mm -hmm. so. We want to be we on the Francesca plan. side of good. <laughs> just so you know yeah <laughs> I haven't seen it but <laughs> yeah. again no offense anyway those in those areas it's again just uh, the way it's they were designed and how they were yeah. timed. so Mr. Haney I think I went over the thing that was in your comments for tonight I think we addressed some of the CUP we, we talked about the waivers um, I think at this point unless the board had any further discussion I think continuance to the 28th of June is appropriate yeah, and they have plenty to respond to, and I'm sure look forward to it. Um, so, is there anything else, or did what you do from the applicant? Yeah, so I have to nope, I'm also, I'm also addressing it now. Okay. Okay. So, would anybody like to make that motion? I'll make a motion to continue case number 23 004 SUB um, to the June 28th meeting at 7 p.m. here in this room. Is there a second? I'll second it. That's a motion by Mr. McKinnon and a second by Mr. Davies to continue to June 28th, 2023 at 7 p.m. Um, any further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor, please say aye. All opposed, that motion carries 5-0. And again, for anybody in attendance, uh, that's all the notice that goes up for this. There'll be a notice online, usually when we receive new materials. Our uh, main news clerk is good about posting them online for the public. There's nobody else here. But uh, there's no more butter notifications that go out by mail. Thank you all. I appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Next on our agenda is other. Uh, this is a, no. I don't think we have any other. Uh, I'll cover my stuff. In, actually, I'll just go over it now. Uh, we had a few action items for me at the last time I was here, not the last meeting prior to that. One was um, to send a letter to the select board regarding um, the motion from this board to appoint another representative to SRPC 
in an alternate. I uh, believe hopefully they took action on that at the last Selectman meeting. Uh, yes, they did. Yeah, they did. I watched that meeting. Yeah. yeah. So I believe those are approved. So uh, Cheryl Smith uh, as uh, another representative and Ms. Bascom uh, agreed to be an alternate for us um, in case either Ralph wasn't there. So that we, again, we are now voting uh, voting rights there. Uh, the other one was a letter, I think a letter to, to um, the state, the state parks division regarding the planned expansion of Protect Away. Again, we have zero purview over that from this board, uh, but we are allowed comment. So based on some of the feedback we've received, I did draft a letter and send it on to the state. And I asked uh, the land use clerk to also CC, uh, the, I believe I sent it to the PLIA, but maybe if not, we sent it to our, our state reps and state senator so that they're aware of our, um, our comments there. I did not hear anything back. Yeah, select board, sorry, land use office, uh, representing Brulard and Tudor and Senator Pro. So I think that gets, that gets us caught up on that. Um, and I know notification about the DRI design and the regional impact for the other case did go out to, so we'll, we'll address that at the, when that comes back up. That brings us to public comment. This is the time of night we reserve, always reserve time for the public to come forward and ask us questions, just get to know us. Um, we can't speak about specific projects or applications. There's nobody here, but again, we reserve this time every, every meeting. We have one set of minutes, uh, May 10th. Uh, I don't know, my suggestion would be that we table those unless anybody feels differently. Yep, no, let's uh, take a look at them. And we'll have, so we, I know those in the site walk minutes just went out um, for review. And again, thank you all for attending, for being at the site walk for anybody that was there. Select board, staff board member updates. I'll start with Mr. Davies. I'm all set. Ms. Bassman. All set, thanks. Okay. Myself, uh, I think I went over mine. I have, um, well, I'll, I'll share it and then we can either kind of table it for later and stuff, but um, I know at the May 10th meeting, we we're kind of going over priorities for what we're going to do for cleanup and ordinances and stuff. Um, and I'd like to propose that we consider an ordinance um, for wireless exposure. Um, I attended a presentation um, that uh, talked about kind of it was a community in Massachusetts that's being negatively impacted by uh, 5G wireless um, towers but in it which was which was really interesting and I have a handout that I can pass out but in 2019 in the state of New Hampshire there was actually a commission um, study commission to study the environmental and health effects of uh, evolving 5G technology. And through that report, they had several, I think 15 recommendations. And out of the 15 recommendations, there's actually three um, that the planning board could have some purview over if we wanted to do it. Um, so I'm throwing it out there. I, I have a handout which has a link to the study and then uh, the three recommendations um, that we could take a look at. There are existing um, towns, both in New Hampshire and Massachusetts, that have some ordinances that they've put into place. Um, here, I'll pass that to you and pass that your way. Um, that we could model. So if we were want to, if we did want to do it, it's not like we're creating it. We could take a look at what those other communities have and see what we uh, what we want to do. But the study did find that within you know a certain vicinity of feet of um, these towers, there are health negative health effects, um, and so maybe we can be a little more. A look, at, a look at this and we do have a wireless communication overlay district already. I was just going to say. So it might be potentially an amendment to that as the board sees fit. Um, 
And I think this is definitely something we should keep in mind as we, especially when we go to have a uh, joint ZBA meeting later this year. Make sure that this gets you know, shared, this and any others that maybe may come forward. Yeah. That's all I got. And I, I, I remember bring it back. Sorry, Mr. Haney. Um, I did reach out to uh, Fougier Planning, Mark Fougier, and I apologize if I'm mispronouncing his name. Uh, it's the only individual that I know of in the area, and I was connected to him through SRPC uh, to discuss possibly of reviewing our impact fees. And because again, those are studies. Our last ones were done. Uh, the school one was not updated online, but we did review it in 2016 17 with the others. Um, so they're all kind of due. Um, for me, if we have to prioritize, it's obviously fire. We need to, to review immediately as, or as soon as possible and address. I reached out to the town administrating uh, administrator um, for some guidance to, to see, you know, how do we move forward? Do we need to do an RFP or, uh, to get proposals uh, to, and then budget for it? Is it in our budget? Or if we potentially split off and do the fire immediately and leave the others as they are until potentially next year, um, is that within our budget potentially to, to do without an RFP? I don't know what dollar amounts we're talking about, uh, what, where that threshold is. So hopefully by the next meeting, I'll have more information for everybody is, is so that we can start moving forward. That's what I was curious about. I was like, you know, if you don't want to change the structure of the impact ordinance, um, but we know, for example, that fire doesn't, it's not published any sort of infrastructure improvements on their CIP that would qualify. Can we simply zero it out? You can keep it there or give it a, give it a zero dollar figure and just keep to to keep the line item i think it's not like a budget where you have to put one i think to keep it but because again you could always like you said i think it's just a public hearing process it's not like we have to go to town vote to do that right but um, hearings, yeah. from a money standpoint then maybe you don't even need man hours to help you update something but um, right i know you asked for some interpretation on it yeah, clarification that there wasn't something that applied to that we well weren't aware as, of as well as to confirm with the town is there something that we're not aware of um, yeah. I I'm not aware of anything that the fire is proposing that would qualify for impact fees but there may be that you know an expansion not maintenance but expansions things like that um, but if they don't use their impact fees they're going to go back to the it's returned after correct six, six years, years. Six years. So, so what you're saying Ian it makes the most sense if you zero them out we can bring them back in when at they, any point a, at any point when they come up with a request yeah yep. um, well the, tr the tricky part there is if next year they are in this CIP function this fall if we zero it out now in June and then they issue 10 building permits between now and the fall and we're like oh shoot there is something on the CIP you've now lost because somebody could pay in now and then two years from now their their funds are still in that account and could be used towards that so you get a but if we know for four years it's not going to be something then you kind of have to well we got no way of knowing that there's going to be nothing but on the other hand all the money's not going to go back at once it's going to go back piecemeal but you won't be collecting anything if you zero it out right so if i don't collect anything now what anything done within six years wouldn't have had as much paid into it right so the, the first part is getting confirmation from from the town of is there anything that would qualify for CIP or you know an impact fee planned so that that we're not aware of so again expansion of the fire station uh, an additional apparatus because of how much it's grown you know a substation things like that to my knowledge no that's none of that's on the agenda right now but that's what we need to be able to unfortunately that probably to be one of the pieces that's needed that that to assess an impact fee so if we if that's not there then the appropriate thing i think would be zeroing it out until and if the cap in the fall changes and they say oh now there are items then we would have to review it again then and change it. and it might be as simple as you know i know the cap won't form until the fall um but the town administrator might be able to consult with town staff that they know of if there is a discussion or something because again i'd hate to like all of a sudden zero it out for six months and then find out oh shoot we, we do need it back yeah and then you've lost out on 10 building permits that affect it and i think we all agree that um 
we might not know the, the details of a plan thing until CIP because that forces right. somebody to think of those things. But um, anybody could, as it is now, when they get that assessed, which is a time of billing permit, not a time of subdivision approval, it's, they, they collect it with the billing permit, is um, anybody that's getting assessed now could, could appeal it. You can ask the select board to they can, they can ask them. They can come out for us to waive it, I believe, yeah. or they could uh, appeal as being applied because our justification for it in our own study yeah. was specifically the fire station. So I think we can all agree that a growing community inherently is going to require more infrastructure, but we got to make sure it applies under what, what we can qualify. Right. We have yeah. to fit the law, the rule to RSA yeah. and all. So, yeah. so hopefully, again, by next meeting, hopefully I'll have direction and we can make a de definitive plan on. on at least that piece and then move forward with the, the bigger part of it not kicking it down the road but we may have to kick parts of it down the road um, we always get these butter notifications now and HDES so there was just two one was just a, a temp, uh, seasonal dock permit the other one was a uh, shoreland permit that was approved uh, back to 1200 square feet on North River, River Lake to construct in addition to an existing non-conforming primary structure both of those were approved I believe, I believe that's it. So, Mr. Haney, you go first. Um, so, after some conversation with uh, Jen, I uh, spoke to uh, the town here uh, for deliverables in terms of um, staff reports. The idea, the the goal is, I mean, it kind of has been, but like really trying to hold to it is get staff reports for new applications to you by the Friday before the meeting, and then. For new submissions, like for example, this project by the Monday before, um, you know, anything that I can do earlier than that is, is what I'm, what I would like to do. I, know, I would love to get it off my desk as soon as possible. But I mean, the idea is just, just especially with new uh, with submissions for existing for continuing plans. Yeah. It's when they get it to us. And last week he got it to us on the Friday, you know, late Friday. So that's the goal. That's what we're trying to. Stick to so hopefully we can get that to you guys, give you time to review, um, and uh, you know prepare along with all the other things that you have to prepare. So, um, but beyond that, if there's anything else that you have, you want to reach out to me directly, feel free to. You all have my email, phone number, stuff like that. So, um, yeah. um, there actually is one thing I think. Oh, I guess I yes. don't know. Did you want to mention that this? Because I think she. I just. I know yeah. she mentioned. I don't know who received this because it was all blind CC. So um, I was in, I don't know if other board members were, but um, our town administrator, Ellen White, sent out an email regarding the hazard mitigation plan update. So I think, I assume she, I think she included a lot of board members yeah. or whatever she had. So. Um, when did it go out today? It yeah. Just today. Oh, maybe it's in my email. It was like 1 p.m. today. Um, it is TA at, so it's one of those suspicious emails when it's just like a generic email. So maybe it's in like a junk folder or a filter. But uh, uh, essentially, it was a BCC email to I think it's just a lot of people in town. The town of Nottingham is due for an update to its hazard mitigation plan with assistance from the Stratford Regional Planning Commission. We're looking to gather up some members to participate in the update process and overview the process attached. So there was a document attached to it highlighting out uh, different. Know, multiple meetings and what they'd like to cover under each. Um, it, was, it was pretty well laid out. Um, ideally, we would like to have six to nine members that are familiar and knowledgeable of the town in various capacities, whether it be facilities, infrastructure, knowledge of past natural disasters, floods, board committee involvement. So, so I think it's obviously looking for public involvement, but people that want to be involved, but also, I guess, uh, feedback from some boards and committees. So. Um, Please let me know as soon as possible if you have any interest. Uh, so I guess she's just gathering names. We were looking to schedule the first two meetings in June. The time is of the essence. I don't know what those dates would be. I think she's trying to collect names, and I'm good luck trying to find schedule overlaps that everybody can do. But um, especially June. Yeah, they get enough. June they get is here next week. But, together, sometimes they can usually you know, a couple meetings. You know, if they get enough, four, they yeah. show up for the first one, and then a different, you know, two of those folding out. Know, yeah. Next. So, so I'll be leading that that report okay. since I have familiarity with the community, you know, through this work. Um, I do know she sent that out, so I appreciate that. Uh, the end of the fiscal year is the end of June, so there's a little bit of hurry up to try and get 
some of the information together. Uh, and the first two meetings are kind of where sort of front loaded, get some feedback from you guys. Uh, they're daytime meetings. Um, it's not going to be more night meetings, and they're only going to be about four or five. Um, so your commitment is not very long, uh, especially with this one. If we do actually, in fact, have two in May or yeah. June, will it be hosted here or will it be hosted by SRPC? So, bunch of pitch or virtual here? Oh, we can do it virtual. I would prefer it, but um, just because it gets more people together right. and easier. But there are. I did it in Barrington. They insisted on doing it in person, so I went up there. So it's, it, it's what the group wants, but uh, we just have to have them. Sure. So it's a collaborative in-person feel that I think everybody holds on to. Yeah. And um, I, I did reach out when I reached out to the TA uh, about the town administrator about impact fees. As I mentioned, possibility you know in that review, maybe even reviewing to see if others maybe have applicable there's been a lot of talk at the select board level about the recycling center in fact these recycling centers are one of the areas that public have impact in general, yeah. so things like that so are there other areas that should be potentially added I believe those have to go through Warren articles that they did um, and I also again just extended an invite to come before us and come with, meet us at any time uh, we've got a running list of things that will potentially impact uh, you know, that position as well so uh, we'll have to meet the, the town administrator person and have make sure we have an open dialogue uh, back and forth uh, but I understand they have probably a lot on their plate still probably still adjusting in uh, enough, enough things that I'm sure that, that they're probably trying to get some breathing room on before they come and add, add things to their plate we're not the only show in town we're not, we're not. <laughs> Sue uh, for this Sue has volunteered um, but Good. we are looking for more people I like the idea of it. I just know, I mean, just knowing I have to commit to June, I'm pretty well swamped, especially during the day. I have ungodly schedule for June. If they're virtual, to most months. If they were virtual yeah. during the day, I could they put would, yeah. could, could you not do a hybrid for virtually and in person? I don't think we have, I know SRPC, our PC, you guys have we hybrid do. capability. This doesn't. Yeah. <laughs> That's the problem. That, that would our time. Oh, okay. be, and then you're sending everyone over there that wants to do hybrid, and that I think that would just reduce participation. Okay. So, yeah. It'd be great if we could do stuff like that. Yeah. I think the cost that came back for that was scary for some. <laughs> All right. Anything else? Seeing none. Uh, Motion to adjourn. We we adjourn. It is nine thirty-eight. Thank you, everybody. Good night. Appreciate everybody's time.